Okay, I think we can get started. Um, we're at uh, nine o'clock. Um, welcome to the 2021 uh, Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative Conference. Um, I, my name is Linda Meschke. I work with the Rural Advantage, a nonprofit here in so South Central Minnesota and um, am the host for this year's conference. Um, along with other partners, you can see on this slide on the right side. Um, we have over 200 people registered for the conference this year, so I think that exceeds all our previous conferences, but with Zoom, we have the ability to have people attend that wouldn't otherwise be able to attend in person. Um, this year, we've tried to put a little bit of emphasis on uh, grower nurseries and having them showcased within our conference um, at 12 o'clock each day um, at the end of the, end of the conference day. Um, we will have um, a showcase of the plant nurseries and representatives of those nurseries will give a little presentation about their nursery and what plant materials they have available. Um, also, we have uh, a theme for each day of the conference. Um, today, it's on agronomics. Um, tomorrow will be uh, research topics. And then on Saturday will be marketing and uh, processing emphasis. So, um, so let's get started off. I asked Jason uh, Fishbach to give a little introduction to the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative and uh, uh, he can share that with us now. Good morning, everyone. Good to see all your, uh, all your faces and uh, welcome to our annual Upper Midwest Hazelnut Growers Conference. I believe this is the 12th conference held since 2010 through uh, rain and snow and now through a pandemic. So. Uh, glad you could all join us. Uh, the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative was launched in 2007. It's a collaboration of the University of Wisconsin, University of Minnesota, and all of our great nonprofit and grower partners across the uh, Upper Midwest that have been working diligently and patiently over the years to get a hazelnut industry going in the Upper Midwest. Uh, primary focus of our work has been on germplasm improvement. That is our, our number one bottleneck. And as you're gonna hear through the conference uh, the next few days is we've made significant progress and it's really an exciting time to start, to start planting. Uh, we've also made a lot of progress with post-harvest processing. And you know, five, six, seven years ago, you really didn't have many options to get your hazelnuts cracked and cleaned and, and now you do. And so there, there aren't a whole lot ex of excuses left anymore of why you shouldn't grow hazelnuts, right? So, um, I think that's all I'll say for now. You'll hear more about our project and various research components as the, the conference goes. Uh, again, just to reiterate, uh, all of the information uh, that's presented today and all kinds of information about hazelnuts in the upper Midwest are on the, um, our website, midwesthazelnuts.org. I definitely encourage you to poke around on that website and there's all kinds of information about plant material that's available, all kinds of agronomic recommendations and there's some information where you can see um, about the hazelnut processing capacity that has, has developed. And a shameless plug, uh, there is a donation page for those of you that want to support the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative and the work that it does. There is a page that allows you to make a donation. So um, thanks, Linda, and uh, let's have a great conference. All right, thank you. Um, we're going to go to... Um... Jeff Jensen, and um, well, I thought I had my page loaded here. Um, so Jeff is a program manager for the Working Watersheds, Buffers and Beyond program with Trees Forever and is field coordinator for Northwest Iowa. He has a bachelor's degree in communication studies and has worked in the field of sustainable agriculture for the past 15 years. He has over 13 years of experience working with landowners and farmers growing perennial crops and is active with several existing organizations and partners, including the Iowa Nut Growers Association. He grows nuts and berries on his farm, Nut Haven, in north central Iowa. Jeff? Thank you, Linda. Excellent. So I am going to uh, cancel my face and then get to my presentation here and uh, we'll jump into it.
Okay, um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. And so thank you for inviting me to uh, present here at the 2021 Hazelnut Conference. Um, so I've titled my presentation, The Best Laid Plans of Mice and Men, because we're here this morning to really talk about planning. And so we want to be planning for success. And what are some of those things that we need to be doing now before a seedling ever goes into the ground uh, to have that planning um, lead to that success? So before we go any further, I just want to mention that, you know, I'm, this is going to be about 30 or 40 minutes this morning with some questions and answers. However, the um, Iowa Nut Growers Association has put together an Iowa Hazelnut Academy, where we have eight different sessions focused on various um, growing um, issues, starting from the Iowa Hazelnut Project, what is it, uh, through the Hazelnut Primer, planning, planting, maintenance, harvesting, processing, marketing. Uh, we've done this. This is a ses second version, so it improves every time. And we're just finishing up um, session six, I believe it is, or pardon me, five. And uh, so we're looking to offer this again sometime here in probably April or May. Uh, if you're interested in participating in the future with an in-depth look at some of these topics, uh, my contact information will be listed at the end of the presentation. Feel free to give me a call or send me an email and uh, we'll get you included. Okay, so the agenda for today is all about planning, and I cannot stress how important this is. Um, uh, planning takes into account all of those things we need to think through so that we can minimize the amount of money that we lose, we can minimize the time that's wasted, and we can have a successful planting. So I'm going to start off with what is your goal, because I think that is the number one question we should be asking every time we're looking to do any endeavor, whether it's plant hazelnuts, chestnuts, aronia berries, whatever the case may be. It's important to recognize what your goal is, because when we know what our goal is, it facilitates decision making down the, down the line. Uh, the next we want to talk about planning for success and then some of those topics like site selection, layout, plant and roll spacing, site prep, and then finally just answering some of your questions. Okay, so goals matter. And the uh, overall question is, why do you wanna grow hazelnuts, right? A lot of folks are interested in just having uh, some nuts for the wildlife. Perhaps you enjoy hazelnuts, they taste good and you wanna have some for your own consumption. As a member of the Iowa Nut Growers Association, something that um, really surprised me when I first got started is we're an organization that has a lot of hobbyists. So folks that are perhaps retired, they live on an acreage, and so they're interested in some sort of uh, fruit or berry crop. And so just for fun or hobby, they decide to get involved with uh, growing hazelnuts or chestnuts, whatever the case may be. I imagine a lot of us here are interested in growing hazelnuts as a potential future crop. So actually generating some revenue you know, back to the farm family. And so if that's the case, then we really want to be um, taking into account all of those planning steps because we, A, don't want to waste money, and B, we want to get our hazelnuts up and producing as quickly as possible. And then certainly uh, climate change is real. We know this uh, annual row crop production is going to uh, exacerbate carbon and, and, and other um, um, uh, issues like that where we can have agroforestry and hazelnut crops, they're actually gonna mitigate uh, some of that uh, climate change through seed carbon sequestration, as well as improving water quality and a whole sort of other um, benefits. And then finally, maybe there's some other reason you wanna grow hazelnuts, you know, whatever that may be, but goals do matter. So what do you wanna do? Why do you wanna grow hazelnuts? And just put it out on paper. That's my number one uh, suggestion to folks as my role with Trees Forever and a field coordinator, I meet with lots of different landowners looking to do conservation practices, looking to do agroforestry projects. And that initial interview is always, what do you want? What's your goal? So let's jump into some of the, uh, the topics uh, that we need to know about when we, again, before we ever put a plant into the ground. So when we're talking about site selection, uh, generally speaking, Hazelnuts don't like wet feet. So that is to say they're not really a true riparian species um, that'd be down by the river bottoms like your sycamores or your black walnuts or your um, um, silver maples and things like that. They're typically a little bit higher up in the landscape um, on, on a, some better soils. Now that doesn't mean that hazelnuts won't grow uh, where it's a little bit wetter. They certainly will. But if our goal is production, um, then we need to think of sites that are going to facilitate production and be good for production and get us what we need. And so um, not planting in, in you know, wetland areas, uh, riparian areas, 
but finding a good site that's well drained with, with good high quality soil. They do like full sun, certainly. Again, that doesn't mean that they can't handle partial shade. So if we think of the oak savanna ecosystem, you know, hazelnuts and some of the um, wild grapes and the, the ribes and some of those would be those understory crops um, in that oak savanna system. So they can certainly live um, with partial shade. But again, if the goal is to get production, full sun is certainly going to be recommended. Again, hazelnuts can grow on a wide range of soils. However, as you can imagine, those clay soils are gonna impede that root growth and thus the overall growth of that plant. On the other end of the spectrum, certainly, those sandy soils are great for root growth, lots of air capacity, but they're gonna lack that organic matter that's necessary for the water holding capacity of those soils. So if we're gonna be planting on sandy soils, we need to either think about trying to increase that organic matter if we can beforehand, if not, what is our irrigation plan? How are we gonna keep these things watered uh, at least those first two years, if not longer on those sandy soils? And then finally, you know, they might favor slightly acidic soils, uh, but are certainly gonna tolerate a pH of 5.5 to uh, 7.5. So again, some of those considerations to think about um, as we think about site selection. Something that I wanna share with you is um, a way that in Iowa anyways, and I apologize, this is maybe gonna be a little bit specific to Iowa, but I think other states might have something similar. I know Minnesota has uh, a project they're working on that's supposed to be wrapped here up here in 2021, uh, where uh, all the different regions of Minnesota are breaking down into the different forestry types and things like that. And so that might be a way, I, mean, I have to assume Wisconsin has something similar, but if they don't, don't worry about it. But is my site suitable for hazel production? And in Iowa, we have uh, some great tools. So one of the first things we want to find out is what is my soil type on the area that I want to plant hazelnuts? Then once we know that soil type, uh, we can use uh, the Iowa DNR Woodland Suitability Guide to cross-reference that soil type with some to determine what are the recommended hardwood, conifer, and shrub species that should be planted in those areas um, depending on the soil type. So we're just going to go through it real quick here. Um, I'm, this isn't a full-blown tutorial, but I do want to give you a sense of, of how you can figure this out for yourself. So first of all, the Web Soil Survey, anybody, whether you're an Iowa native or not, can utilize this great tool. Uh, so this is what it looks like if you Google Web Soil Survey. You'd click on the, uh, the little green uh, button to start the Web Soil Survey, and that will take you then to a map of the United States. And then on the left-hand column there, um, some different uh, navigation tools. And so for you to get to wherever your site is uh, on the map, you could essentially either type in the address or you could just uh, through the magnifier button on the upper left-hand corner, continually just zooming in to where your particular site might be. Either one of those ways will get you to um, your particular site. Now, once you're at your site, this is what it will kind of look like. Uh, you've zoomed in to a field or an area that you want to plant into. And so now you're going to want to highlight your area of interest. It's called the AOI. And that's just basically highlighting a box or a rectangle around that area that you want to find out what the soil type is. And there's two different ways you can do this with a simple um, square box here, or you can use the polygon if you don't have a, a perfect uh, square site uh, that's kind of jagged or, or rectangular, whatever the case may be. But utilizing uh, one of those two will get you then your area. And once you've highlighted your area, now you can find out the soil type by going to the top of the page and clicking on the soil map tab. And what that'll do is it's going to go ahead and break down that area that you highlighted and it's going to tell you what those soils are. So in this particular instance, this is the Struker Joint Performance Trial that's located uh, just north of Fenton, Iowa. Uh, and this is our northernmost um, joint performance trial in Iowa here. And so on this particular site, uh, we have two predominant soil types. We have this 135 colon clay loam, and it's only about a hack, half acre, pardon me, of the overall um, planting site. And then we have this 107, which is a Webster clay loam. Uh, again, it comprises over 80% of the entire area, um, um, almost two acres. 
So now we have these, these two soil types, and in your particular case, it may be three, four, five, six different soil types, depending on uh, the site that you have. So the next information that we're gonna be able to get is to um, take this and get a report. We can actually run a report from the web soil survey that's gonna give you all sorts of great information. And so one of the things you can do on the left-hand side here is you can give your report a title. In this case, it's the Struker Research Site. And then you have a bunch of options on what to actually include in that report itself. So uh, a lot of good information. So here's what things look like. The table of contents has information on how soils uh, surveys are made. It has the soil map itself. Um, and then the different soil types, the amount of the soil type uh, in your overall area as a percentage, uh, some other information, what that Webster clay loam, zero to 2% slope, uh, mean annual precipitation, frost free period, farmland classification is prime farmland if it's drained. Uh, some other information you can get about the soil type, uh, the, the profiles, uh, depth to water table, drainage class, poorly drained. Keep in mind that um, the uh, Struker Joint Performance Trial is located in the Des Moines lobe. That's the prairie pothole region of, of uh, Northern Iowa. And so um, indicative of our soils are a lot of poorly drained, um, heavy soils, poorly drained, very fertile, uh, but they need to have some sort of, typically some sort of uh, artificial drainage. And then of course, depth to water table, uh, zero to eight inches, an indication obviously of those uh, heavy, heavy soils. So then after we have the information on what our soil type is, in this case, Webster and then Coland, we can go to the Iowa Woodland Suitability Guide. Uh, this is a great uh, PDF uh, and it lists every single soil type that is out there. And then it classifies that soil type into what's called a Conservation Suitability Group or a CSG. And that's a numerical number one through 10. And so in this case, uh, you can see here, we have our Webster soil. Uh, it's a number two conservation suitability group. So we can continue on in this document and uh, see what these conservation suitability groups are all about. So here's the number one. So the number one is moderately wet, uh, gives some information, uh, a description of those soils. These deep soils are somewhat poorly drained, seasonal high water table, yada, yada. Then it's going to give the recommended species from hardwoods to conifers to then your different shrubs. And as you can see, moderately wet, there's hazelnut. So hazelnut um, is recommended for this type of soil type, one. However, if you remember, our soil type was Webster, a number two. So let's take a look at number two. Now this is considered wet. So these are deep soils, poorly drained, seasonal high water table within a foot of the soil surface. Then we have the hardwoods, the conifers, and the shrubs, and the recommended species. As you can see, a lot less recommended species overall in these wet sites. The wet sites, uh, the wet plants that you do see, again, a lot of those riparian species, silver maple, sycamore, cottonwood, uh, swamp white oak, for instance, river birch. Uh, and then if you get over to the shrub side, you can see there's not a whole lot of great options that are recommended for those wet sites. Now, obviously, a lot of you might be thinking, well, you have a joint performance trial that you set up on an area that's actually not recommended for hazelnuts. What are you doing, Jeff? Well, that's true. However, one of the things we're looking to do here in Iowa is to determine how well hazelnuts do, and then specifically through some of the joint performance trials and the on-farm trials, how some of these experimental genotypes and cultivars are gonna do on all the various landforms of Iowa. So Iowa has roughly six landforms ranging from the Southern Iowa Drift Plain down south um, to the Lus Hills out west. And then certainly, like I mentioned, the Des Moines lobe um, in, in North Central Iowa that goes almost all the way down to Des Moines. And so we want to see how well hazelnuts do on all of these different landforms. Um, for instance, the Des Moines lobe is, is a huge area of uh, several million acres. And so if, um, although it might not be recommended, how do they do so that once we get to some cultivars that we know are gonna be successful, um, what sorts of mitigation strategies might we need to implement to grow them successfully on this wet type of an area? So maybe we need to burn them up a little bit, 
uh, perhaps we just need to have some drainage that's installed to, to be sure that they um, aren't saturated and that water can get away. So in a nutshell, um, these are some of those classifications. Just wanted to point out, uh, I said there was one through 10. Here's the other, a couple of other ones here, well-drained, moist and loamy. So this is gonna be you know, great soils for, uh, for hazelnuts. The well-drained dry loamy, again, uh, they're gonna be well-drained and, and have um, um, good root penetration. Your moderately deep soils, again, these would be great for growing hazelnuts, but, but that's, um, that's how you can essentially tell if you have a good site to grow hazelnuts. And even if you don't have a good site to grow hazelnuts, it gives you a lot of great information about your site uh, that you can use for planting purposes. Okay, so let's move on to uh, site layout and then plant and, and row spacing. And so a couple things that we want to consider here uh, when, we, when we think about the overall landscape and, and, and our overall planting. So are we really looking at a research planting? Are we focused on a production type of a planting? Or perhaps uh, are we looking to install an agroforestry practice like a, a living snow fence or a shelter belt or, or maybe alley cropping, something like that? Because um, the way the, 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 the focus of the planting is going to have some impacts on the decisions that you make. So for instance, a research planting um, is going to necessarily facilitate wider spacing. The goal being that we want each plant to be able to fully express itself. So we don't want it to be possibly shaded out by others. So we want that plant, we wanna see how well that plant does without any other competition. In, in, in a setting where it can fully express its, its uh, genetic, pardon me, its characteristics. A production setting uh, is gonna necessitate much closer spacing because again, we want to put the plants in there, get them off and growing and minimize that space that's not growing hazelnuts. Finally, with an agroforestry practice, you know, a lot of the information on the spacing site layout, more or less is going to be dictated to you depending on the practice that you actually go ahead and utilize. So if you're going to use some NRCS cost share funding or perhaps EQIP or something like that, and you want to do a planting, uh, the practice standard is going to have a lot of that information just specced out to you as far as row spacing, number of plants, uh, so on and so forth. You know, another um, interesting aspect of site plant and row spacing is water. So we know that hazelnuts, especially those first two years, are going to need water how are you going to do that? Is your site close enough where there's a well or a source of water that has adequate pressure where you can perhaps install a drip tape irrigation line? Is your site away from water where you're going to have to truck it in or use a water wagon and perhaps five gallon buckets with a little hole drilled in the bottom? Whatever the case may be, you need to consider watering those first two years because it really is crucial and it's essentially insurance to protect our investment and be sure that um, uh, our hazelnuts are growing strong. Another thing to keep in mind is size of equipment. And this kind of goes hand in hand with harvesting and maintenance, but um, if we're gonna be utilizing equipment in our, let's say it's just uh, harvesting equipment. So we're gonna have some information on harvesting um, uh, that's been done with over the row blueberry harvesters or the aronia berry pickers that split the row in half and some of those things. Well, those pieces of equipment need enough space at the ends of the, the rows to be able to turn around to go down into the next row. So something as simple as being sure you have at least 25 to 30 feet, you know, as a minimum to be able to turn your equipment around is going to be crucial. Uh, perhaps you're going to utilize um, a lawnmower or a small garden tractor uh, to do maintenance or, or uh, to work within your hazelnut planting. You know, what's that row spacing? We plant plants that are 10 feet apart within our, our rows are 10 feet apart, pardon me, uh, 10 or 15 years later, those plants are going to grow into one another to the point where you will not get uh, um, a riding lawnmower or a small garden tractor through that row. So again, just thinking through, okay, what sort of equipment am I thinking I might be utilizing? And then do I have enough space to accommodate that? Topography is another uh, interesting idea because certainly if we're looking at some hilly areas, we don't want to be planting hazelnuts up and down the hills because that could potentially facilitate uh, erosion. And so we want to be going and planting on the contour of the 
those um, of those hills and stuff like that. And then finally, harvesting and, and maintenance. So how are we gonna harvest? Is it gonna be hand harvest? Is it gonna be some sort of mechanical harvesting? Uh, maintenance wise, are we gonna be doing controlling weeds and other woodies through chemicals, through landscape fabric, through mulch? Uh, and all of those are going to impact our site layout and our plant and row spacing. So wanted to show here, this is the Struker Joint Performance Trial. So this is the area that I just showed you on the web soil survey. Uh, where we have um, um, uh, the joint performance trial of all of these experimental genotypes, uh, the northernmost site here in Iowa. And you can see that uh, every single plant uh, gets a square four by four piece of landscape fabric. Uh, that landscape fabric is um, staked to the ground with some metal staples on all four corners, as well as all four sides. So eight metal staples go into each one of those pieces of landscape fabric. In this particular case, we put a tree tube uh, over every single one of those. Uh, if you can see in the background there, a couple of them have cages if they're more bush type versus tree type. Uh, and then you can see the buckets there as well uh, with the little holes in the bottom uh, for watering. And this site layout has 10 feet between plant. Again, we want to allow these plants to fully express themselves. And then 15 feet between the rows. Here's the Lawrence Joint Performance Trial. Uh, again, this is down in Marion, Iowa, uh, right along basically Interstate 80 in the middle of the state. Similar setup, we have 10 feet between the plants and then 15 feet between the rows there. Now here's a, a this was the very first planting that I ever did uh, on my farm, uh, my parents' farm actually, Hazel Acres. And this one was spaced five feet between plants and then 15 feet between the rows. That's a little bit wider than what I wanted. However, this particular site before being planted to hazelnuts was actually a soybean field. And I did not have my cover crop planted before um, the hazelnuts went in. Therefore, I was basically, uh, I had to have wide rows so that I could put the disc up in between the rows of hazelnuts to seed down the clover and grass mix there. And then I just wanna show 15 years later, you can see 15 feet between the rows there. Almost 15 years later, those bushes have grown in quite a bit. You know, some of these, these bushes can have a diameter of anywhere from eight to 10 or 12 feet. And so they can really help to fill in that row. And, um, and you'll see that, especially with this next planting here. So this is, this is my farm. In this particular, uh, before it was my farm, I planted this for a neighbor and uh, we did the planting here at six feet between plants and then 10 feet between rows. Uh, this is what I consider an A plus planting, the gold standard with the landscape fabric, drip tape irrigation, um, well maintained, well cared for. And 15 years later, actually this is 10 years later, uh, this is one of the rep, ag reps at our local community college, um, at 10 years, almost touching, and at 15 years, these absolutely were touching so that um, it was difficult to even walk down the middle of that row. Uh, the, the row had essentially filled in, the, the alleyway, I should say, had filled in from the hazelnut bushes on either side. So they can grow, they will grow. Now, in a production setting, one of the things that um, for a lot of fruit producers, there's been a, a real focus on dwarf. Uh, because obviously the smaller the plant, the more fruit you can get uh, because you can plant, pack, pardon me, more plants into an acre of space. So eventually once we get to some experimental genotypes and have cultivars then that are um, readily available out of those experimental genotypes, we might have rows that are smaller. We might have plants that are only eight feet tall, six feet tall. We just don't know yet. But the point is, is depending on that plant size, uh, we need to have a spacing that's going to work for us and then work for the equipment that we, we might want to use to grow our hazelnuts. So let's talk a little bit about uh, site preparation again. These are things that should happen basically at least a year ahead of time before any plants go into the ground. And a couple of things to consider here is what was that that previous crop or site condition. Uh, and then soil testing, that's very important. 
how are we going to be controlling weeds and then how will plants be established and that controlling weeds and how will plants be established kind of go hand in hand so let's look at the other two first so this is again the lawrence joint performance trial uh, this is the day where we laid out the orchard uh, dell went ahead and mowed this this was pasture for many many years and then just a couple of years prior to the hazelnuts being planted it was just um, in, in grass and and some volunteer uh, trees and shrubs. And so those were cut out, uh, the grass was mowed down, and then we went ahead and, and laid out our rows of hazelnuts. Uh, so in this particular case, basically it was a sod setting. Uh, again, here on, on hazel acres, the very first planting that I ever did, this was previous to the hazelnuts being planted, a soybean field, which was great. Uh, it was soybeans, it was relatively weed free. Um, it hadn't been tilled or anything like that. And so it was kind of a, a blank canvas for me to, to be able to install, or pardon me, to establish these hazelnuts and, and then the uh, clover and grass between the different rows. Now here is a little bit different circumstance. So here is the, again, the, um, the Struger Joint Performance Trial. This particular um, site it was 13 acres. And out of that 13 acres, like 10 acres was eligible for CRP that the landowner um, enrolled in. That extra three acres, he didn't really want to fiddle with farming it. So he just planted it into grass and, and a row of willow trees there. So when I approached him about establishing a joint performance trial here, uh, he was all for it uh, because it was just land that wasn't being really utilized in any way, shape or form. But it, uh, it did pose a problem because of that row of willow trees, which needed to be removed because I didn't want to have shading as an issue for this joint performance trial. I wanted all of those bushes to be able to have full sun. So again, we could, they could fully express themselves. So we had to do quite a bit of work of actually uh, cutting down that row of willow trees, uh, taking all of that biomass, pushing it to the end of the row and burning it up. And then we had, um, had a local farmer uh, come with his excavator and dig out uh, the root balls there. And then um, we took those and pushed them all to the end. And then as best we could, uh, dissed over that area to feather it in. And, um, and now we had a, a nice clean slate, so to speak, for us to be able to plant our, our hazelnut joint performance trial into. And here you can see, we just mowed then the, the, the grass area um, before we uh, laid out our, our flags and before we did our burn down uh, around each of those flags. So again, you know, what was that prior condition to you going in to establish your hazelnuts? So soil testing. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on soil testing. Uh, we have a presentation a little bit later here this morning all about uh, fertilization and leaf tissue analysis. The only thing I'm going to mention about soil testing is just do it. Follow the Nike brand and just do it. Uh, so here again, before we put any plants in the ground, uh, Dell and I uh, took uh, with a soil probe a composite soil test for the entire area. Uh, sent that off to be analyzed for organic matter, your NPK, and then even some of your micronutrients like boron, for instance, because some of those micronutrients aren't going to readily move in the soil. So you might have to do some amendments um, prior to establishment and then work those amendments into the soil potentially. Uh, so again, just it's important that you do a soil test to know what that fertility is, to know what you're dealing with so that you can plan and manage accordingly. So I mentioned the controlling weeds and, and kind of how will plants be established is going almost hand in hand. Um, so controlling weeds, what are we going to do? Are we going to use some sort of a chemical burn down? Are we going to do some sort of a tillage? Um, what is your means for controlling weeds prior to establishment and then obviously after establishment with ongoing maintenance? And then hand in hand with that is how will plants be established? So what type of plants are you getting? <laughs> So in this particular case, I wanted to point out that this site, this is an interesting site because this has both side by side. So we have a site on the right hand side that you can't hardly see that is sod planted to hazelnuts um, where we just took a little circle, roughly a foot, foot and a half with chemical spray to kill the weeds, the grass, and then planted the seedling right into it. And then the other half of the planting, uh, we mow or plot well, we did a burn down with uh, a chemical spray, we mowed it off, scalped it down to the ground, mold bore plowed it, flipped that soil up, and then did a disking uh, pass to level out that site. And so uh, this was kind of the site prep that we did in that particular case. 
Now I mentioned what type of seedlings. So um, let's talk real quickly because this is really where decisions need to be made that are gonna impact then things like uh, landscape fabric, weed control, so on and so forth. So you can see that some of these roots are, are pretty massive with some of these bare root seedlings. Um, here's a great up close look at that uh, root mass. And so to plant this successfully, we really need to be thinking of digging a shallow, wide hole so that we can lay those roots out, um, backfill and let this uh, plant get on with it. That's gonna be a little bit different as we look at maybe a potted plant. Uh, so again, we're gonna want to have a, a relatively wide hole. So at least um, 1.5 the diameter of the pot itself. Uh, this might be a little bit deeper though. And so you could maybe use a ground auger or a PTO driven auger to actually auger these in to make that hole. The, the, the general theme here is don't be planting too deep. So whether it's trees or shrubs, whatever the case may be, don't plant too deep because um, there's no quicker way to kill trees than to plant them too deep. So another option is gonna be these liners, which are kind of standard in the horticultural industry, four by four banded pots. These are nine inches deep, other ones uh, maybe six inches deep. And so something like this is gonna be real easy to plant into existing landscape fabric that's put, put down. Also relatively easy to plant into a, a sod formation. Um, you can use a little tool like this. This is a steel power head with a little five inch auger or a four inch auger on it. And you can go through in a day's time and, and uh, plant all sorts of hazelnuts by just drilling a little hole, uh, popping that liner in and uh, off you go. So in this particular case, you can see where the landscape fabric has been laid. I can take a, a knife and make a little slit in that landscape fabric. I can drill a little four inch hole pretty easily right there, plant my plant, backfill, uh, and then take that uh, little flap that's been cut in landscape fabric and kind of put it back around that plant. And that's really gonna reduce the, uh, the weed pressure there because of that landscape fabric. Um, However, if this was going to be utilized in the situation where we had bare root dormant plants, you know, you would be cutting a hole that's huge in that landscape fabric, having to fold it back, uh, come back over the top. So um, how are you going to manage weeds? Because it's going to have an impact. Speaking of landscape fabric, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the maintenance stuff on Saturday, but just wanted to point out. So here again, I showed we have a four by four um, kind of square with the, the staples. And this works relatively well, right? One of the things that's gonna happen though, uh, hazelnuts like to sucker. And so they'll run to the end of the row or the end of the landscape fabric and then send up suckers. And so that can be a problem that you have to manage or mow, whatever the case may be. But in this particular planting here, I wanted to point out um, this planting, we utilized a, a machine that actually laid that landscape fabric down and I wanna show it here. So this is a machine pulled behind the tractor. It has two discs in the front that will take dirt and fling it away to make a little trench. Then the landscape fabric gets laid. The wheels keep it in constant contact with the ground. And then those discs on the back of the machine cover up the edge of that landscape fabric so that what you have is the edges are buried. And this does a fantastic job of reducing the suckering that'll come out on the edges of that landscape fabric. So it, it's a great way to uh, lay the landscape fabric. It has a lot of good benefits. However, if you wanna utilize this machine, you essentially have to have tilled ground because it needs uh, fluffy dirt to be able to fling it away and then cover the furrow back up. So you wouldn't be able to utilize this in, in like a sod uh, formation or a sod planting. So again, one of those things that we need to think about and keep in mind uh, as we're planning for our planting. I've gone on long enough, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of things in summary. Uh, planning for your hazelnut planting, again, needs to start at least a year before you ever put plants in the ground. I cannot tell you how many calls I've had for people that are interested in hazelnuts. Uh, they're looking for information on where to get plants and, and row spacing and stuff like that, uh, but they haven't done a soil test. They don't really, they have an idea of maybe where they want to go, but haven't done any weed uh, control to control those perennial weeds before or ahead of time. And so I just wanna really stress the importance of planning and having a good plan in place. Next is decisions, decisions, decisions. And I really think of growing hazelnuts as kind of one of those choose your own adventure books, right? Because if you remember those choose your own adventure books, you're, you're reading along and all of a sudden you come to a fork in the road. You gotta go this way or you gotta go that way. 
And so the decisions that we make are going to dictate uh, other decisions that need to be made. So for instance, if we're going to say, okay, I'm going to plant only bare root dormant plants, that's what's available, that's what I think is going to be successful, then what am I going to use for weed control? Am I going to be able to utilize landscape fabric? Am I going to just use the wood mulch? Is that a better option for me? And so as that tree branches off, those decisions um, need to be made that will take you down a particular path. You know, don't skip this step. Um, again, if I could hound on anything, it would be plan, 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 because uh, a lot of growers have wasted a lot of time and money um, essentially doing something that somebody else could have told them would work or doesn't work the best. And so that's why my last bullet point there is simply ask around. You know, we have hundreds or a couple of hundred people that are uh, signed up for this conference. We have over a hundred that I think are online right now. So ask around. There's plenty of folks that have been growing hazelnuts uh, either as a hobby or maybe even semi-commercially. And so just ask. That's what it's all about. So here's my contact information. If folks want to uh, get signed up for the Hazelnut Academy or just have general questions or want to tell me that uh, my presentation sucked, whatever the case may be, this is how you guys can get a hold of me, uh, jeff at janakris.com. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Yeah, we have a few questions that have come in. And um, so I know you're going to talk about uh, weed control on uh, Saturday, but could you just give us a quick uh, mulch versus fabric um, comment? <laughs> No, I can't because it actually, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot of things. So when I started out, I thought landscape fabric was the way to go. I'm still a believer in landscape fabric. Uh, however, um, landscape fabric needs to be used in conjunction with mulch. Just having the landscape fabric out there in and of itself, especially in those research site settings where it's a little four by four square, the wind gets underneath them. They can work those staples loose. Uh, you don't have any cover over the ground to keep the roots warm in the winter time. So if you're in an area where the snow doesn't essentially um, drift up, you know, you can really be susceptible to, to root die out uh, because of the cold temperatures. So there's, it's a little bit more than just use it or don't use it. Um, and then of course, do you want to use either of them or do you want to use some sort of a chemical treatment? Uh, so there's, there's Roundup, there's other um, forestry chemicals that can be utilized in tree farms. Um, do you want to be organic or not? And so those are some of the decisions that will need to be made. Um, but more to come on Saturday. Okay, so everybody tune in Saturday morning um, to get more details on that. All right, someone asked what the name of the um, landscape fabric machine was. I have no idea. Um, I live in northern Iowa, and I had to rent it from uh, St. James Soil and Water Conservation District up in, Linda, help me out here. It's been a while. What one? Watanwan County. Watanwan County. So uh, some of your county conservation boards or uh, SWCDs might have a piece of equipment like this that you can either rent or utilize. Um, I don't know what the name of it is though. And if anybody else knows, please type it in the uh, question and answer box. It's probably just a landscape fabric machine. Yeah, there you go. Okay, then we had a question about landscape fabric and uh, wool problems. Ah, uh, yes. You got any good good thoughts about that? I don't have any good thoughts, but it's an issue. So that uh, Marion Joint Performance Trial that I mentioned down um, on I-80, we're, we're struggling with that right now. So you have that landscape fabric and then you have bowls or moles that like to make uh, tunnels underneath that area because it's a nice area that's uh, not disturbed. And um, I don't have anything to say other than it, you need to be cognizant of it, but I don't necessarily have any answers on how to, how to deal with it. Okay, and then um, we have a question here about, um, do you need a high fence, the, to high fence the crop to prevent deer damage? Thoughts on that? Well, the answer is yes. If you can afford it, put it in. But that really depends on the pressure that you have. So for instance, um, I live in, in Iowa, all around me is corn and soybean fields. I don't have a whole lot of pressure from deer, for instance. I know that's not the case for other people that have struggled with deer um, predation and rubbing and stuff like that. So that's tough because it really depends on your own circumstance. And, and if deer are a problem, you're going to have to figure out a way to control them, whether it's a fence or other mitigation techniques. Some folks have utilized the, uh, the strands of wire, and you can use two strands of wire, offset a third strand of wire. Um, there's a couple of different options that are out there in that regards. But 
You have to be cognizant of it. In my particular case, my biggest pest problem has been rabbits. And um, I live next to a 40 acre CRP. There's lots of habitat. And I had a lot of girdling, not, not early when I had seedlings, but six, seven, eight years into it, I had a couple of winters where the rabbits just really girdled a lot of my great big plants and really did a number on them. And so, uh, well, we got the uh, gun out, we started to thin the population and um, it's a little bit better. Now that 40 acres of CRP has been replaced too with row crops. And so that's really reduced the uh, habitat area, but the rabbits has been an issue for me. Okay, um, should, you, should you plant all the same aged plants or can you uh, intersperse different aged together in your plots? Well, that really is site management, pardon me, um, your overall plan. So logically thinking, one might have a phased approach or we might be putting a row or two every year with different types of uh, cultivars so that we can have diversity throughout that entire planting. Certainly, in the early years, we're going to need a pollen source. So having some seedlings um, within that planting of, of cultivars is going to be very important to ensure that we have enough pollen to be able to produce the nuts that we want. So yes, I, I imagine a scenario where we're going to have different aged plants, certainly the same within a row. So a row is either going to be a cultivar or whatever the case may be. Um, but different rows might be different cultivars and different ages as well. Okay, we have a question about um, how about pollination considerations? And um, Jason's maybe gonna talk about this a little bit too, but um, if you wanna give a comment on that. Well, again, putting, uh, including some seedlings into any sort of a planting of cultivars uh, is gonna be important uh, because we have to have, we need to ensure that there's enough pollen out there. And then the times need to certainly overlap as well. If you get into something like black walnuts, for instance, varieties of black walnuts, um, they have typically a, a two different cultivars that are going to um, pollinate as well as the flowers be at the same time so that there's ensured pollination. And so if you get uh, varieties that are too different that the pollen sheds later than the flowers are have good pollination. Uh, with hazelnuts, we're not at that point yet. And so just adding some seedlings into that overall planting is going to provide you that pollen cloud that's necessary. Uh, but it is very important because if there's no pollen, there's no nuts. And uh, I've had some instances where we've had years where the pollen, the male catkins, um, a really tough winter, the pheasants and stuff are eating on those and that just reduces the pollen cloud and, and thus pollination. Okay, then we have a rec, um, do you recommend growing a cover crop the year before planting the orchard? It really depends, it really depends. Um, you know, personally, it's great if you can go into a sod type of a situation, uh, but, but yet you've controlled some perennial weeds there. Uh, if you're going to do full tillage and till that site up, it's, it's ideal to get a cover crop down right away to reduce any potential erosion. Uh, and then you can come through and, and make a little spot where you're going to plant that individual plant with either a Roundup spray or just mowing it. Or, you know, something I didn't mention is if you don't want to use Roundup, um, I take the weed eater and I'll scalp. I'll take the, the, the to, to bare dirt and then sometimes plant into that and instead of utilizing a chemical burn down. It's still not going to prevent more weeds coming up, but it's going to give you a nice uh, black dirt, um, a little round area to plant your plant into. Okay, we're going to end your session with the final question, which um, you have high expertise in, and that's on uh, squirrels, blue jays, and crows, and controlling those, and um, in specific strategies to uh, foil those pests. Well, blue jays are the worst. I hate those stupid birds. They're beautiful, but they are terrible, terrible. Blue jays are the worst. Squirrels, you know, the squirrels are gonna get some nuts uh, and it's just really depending on uh, the, the pressure that you have. Certainly I know some uh, growers will set conibear traps for, for their uh, squirrels, get them up in the tree so that you don't get the pets or anything into them. Here's the thing. So I don't know what to do about blue jays and crows. I'll tell you this though, on my farm, Nut Haven, I never saw a blue jay on almost eight or five or six years that I lived there until the hazelnuts started to produce on a regular basis. And now all of a sudden I have blue jays. It's, it's amazing, right? Um, they do cause a problem. I used to uh, harvest hazelnuts, put them in their onion sacks and just lay them out in the sun to dry. That's a strategy a lot of small growers when they're first getting started will use. Those blue jays would rip those bags open and, and just 
wing hazelnuts all over the place. I hate them. Blue jays are the worst. A gun, maybe, um, maybe other natural predators to, to blue jays. Again, I'm sorry, I don't have a very good answer. If other folks have better answers, type them in the chat box. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, we'll look forward to your additional presentation on Saturday and um, just picture us all clapping in appreciation. Um, we're gonna go next to um, Jason Fishbach. He's gonna talk about plant varieties and selection um, with some of these new cultivars that are coming out and what's available. Um, Jason has good information on that. He has um, presented some of this more in depth to the hazelnut cluster groups, um, but I wanted him to give a little, an overview here for, for our overall audience. And um, so Jason, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, just doing a sound check, Linda. Everything sound yeah, good? You sound good. All right, great. Uh, so the number one question I get uh, via email, phone, text, you name it, is which hazelnuts should I grow and where can I get them? So I'm gonna to try to answer uh, that question. And uh, this presentation, of course, as all the rest of them will be posted online too. So if you wanna refer back to it. Um, okay, first thing we're gonna do though is go through some terminology. So everybody's on the same page because both seedlings and cultivars or clonal material are going to be, are available and are going to be available uh, over the coming years. And so you need to know what you're buying. So let's start out with seedlings. Uh, this is a confusing term because it's also used to refer to any young plant, but I want us to all be using this term to refer to a plant that's grown from a seed. You see seeds at the bottom and actually uh, starting this week, those of us that do start seeds from, or plants from seed are starting to get all ramped up here because the seeds have been stratified all winter and are starting to crack and we're starting to see some growth. So we got to get those in pots, right? Um, so basically it's, it's easy to do uh, once you kind of get your system down, save the seeds in the fall, keep them moist, keep them cool all winter. And then you can put, uh, start them in a pot in, you know, of any size uh, you see in this picture. And you can grow really nice plants. It's, it's easy to grow hazelnuts from seeds. It's not very easy to grow hazelnuts vegetatively from uh, cuttings or other methods as we'll discuss. But another option, uh, this is a, the DNR nursery up in Hayward, Wisconsin, and they'll grow, you know, large beds, uh, plant the seeds in the fall, put a uh, hardware cloth over the bed, pull that off in the spring when they germinate, and you can get thousands and thousands of plants. So this is how at scale seedlings are grown. They lift those out as bare at dormant, and that's what you might plant. So if you're buying plants from the, from, uh, the DNR, say American hazelnuts, you'd be getting them from this kind of production system. Okay, so a couple things key about seedlings, and I realize this is review for a lot of you, but for those of you that are new, uh, it's important to understand this. Every single plant that comes from a seed is genetically unique, and you don't know how that plant's going to perform necessarily uh, because it comes from a seed, right? Um, you also don't necessarily know how uniform a batch of seedlings will be. So if somebody saves seed from a plant, and grows it all out and sends you plants, you don't really know how uniform those are gonna be. And this has, in a lot of ways, uh, been a good thing for our industry because it's deployed a lot of genetic diversity on the landscape, especially with our hybrids, but it's been a big challenge from a commercialization standpoint because there's so much variability in a planting and so many of these seedlings don't really amount to anything. So the other thing, uh, as we'll talk a little bit later, is uh, when people are saving seed uh, nurseries and growing it out and selling it, uh, the tendency is for them to want to make some claims about how the, the offspring will perform. And so part of this depends is how, how good is mom, where the seed came from, and, and how do you know? If it's a single plant that hasn't been copied and grown at multiple locations, you don't really know if mom is any good. Uh, and so that's an, an important question to ask is if people, if you're buying seedlings from somebody, you want to know something about the parentage and about the source material. The other big question is who's dad uh, for these seedlings? Uh, so mom, we know who it is because that's where we harvested harvest the nuts from, but the pollen could come from wherever. It's windblown. Most likely it came from the nearest compatible neighbor. Um, but usually if they're saving seed from a plant, they're all half siblings, meaning every plant probably has a different dad. 
uh, or most had the same dad and some have other dads, just depends on where the wind was blowing from. Uh, or are they full siblings where there's a controlled cross so we know who mom is and we know who dad is. Uh, so these are just some important questions to be aware of when you're buying seedlings because they're not all the same. All right, so the other side of the coin are uh, is clonal material varieties, we'll sometimes call it, or, or sometimes cultivars. And these are plants that are made through vegetative propagation. You can see me holding a uh, mound layer and look at those beautiful roots at the base of that plant, right? So every uh, layer that I harvested from that mound is genetically identical. There's a bunch of different methods to produce plants this way, uh, stem cuttings, tissue culture, layering, None of them work particularly well for hazelnuts, especially the hybrids. Uh, layering works okay for some, but it's just so slow and the mul multiplication rate initially is so slow. Uh, tissue culture, unfortunately, is proving to be our next biggest bottleneck besides uh, improved germplasm. Um, so the big question here is it's pretty easy through mound layering to say, hey, I found a nice plant in my planting. I'm going to layer it and start selling copies of it. But you as a grower need to know how extensively has that mother plant been evaluated? If it's just the one plant, you really don't know and you can't really predict how that plant's gonna perform if it's copied and grown at your own location. So again, this is a question that you should be asking nurseries is, tell me about that plant. How, is it, how, how many copies are there in existence? Where has it been tested? Where has it been grown? How long has it been grown there? And that'll give you better information about uh, how that plant might perform on your particular property. Okay, so we've got seedlings and we've got clones. So now let's jump into the available plant material for 2021, 2023. Generally, there are four categories, and I'll go through each of these. The European hazelnut cultivars, the American hazelnut seedlings, both of which I would argue are not really options for us uh, here in the upper Midwest. And then we have the hybrids, the, both seedlings and cultivars. All of this information is presented in more detail at this URL. Go to our midwesthazelnuts.org website, find the buy plants page, and you will see a written publication that talks about, uh, goes into way more depth than I can today. Uh, and it also is updated regularly on the website itself in terms of uh, plants that are in nurseries, plants that are available in nurseries that are selling them. So we try to get that updated at least monthly. So keep checking back because things are changing fast. So let's start with the European hazelnut cultivars. If you've ever been in a, in a mature orchard in Oregon, uh, this is you know, what it looks like. It's really pretty astounding. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if we could grow this stuff because there's been decades of breeding and they've come up with some really nice plant material. The two that are most uh, popular right now are Yamhill and Jefferson. They have single gene resistance to Eastern filbert blight. And uh, two things about this. So these have been trialed in Ontario and they were, the hope was it would supply the uh, Ferrero Rocher plant in Brantford, Ontario. And unfortunately, both suffer winter injury and Eastern filbert blight, the disease, the fungal disease, which is native in our region, including Ontario, overcame the resistance that was in Yamhill and Jefferson. So for two reasons, we can't grow these. They're not winter uh, hardy, reliably winter hardy, and they're not sufficiently disease resistant. Now, uh, that's pure European hazelnuts. Now, there are four new releases coming from the uh, Rutgers uh, breeding program. Tom Molnar has been selecting uh, and breeding for European hazelnut varieties for the Atlantic seaboard in New Jersey. And they have just recently released uh, four varieties. And I believe Foggy Bottom Farms uh, will be presenting, uh, I think, today at the end here and can talk about the plant material that they have available and when. Uh, Tom, the breeder, is recommending these for zones six and seven. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of zones six and seven in the upper Midwest unless you're in a really protected region uh, next to maybe Lake Michigan, for example. Um, and so he is saying, OK, it's fine to trial it, zone four, zone five. But they have not yet been tested anywhere in the upper Midwest. The first of this plant material uh, will go into our joint performance trials this spring at the six locations. And so we'll start to get some information, but you know, quite frankly, we fully expect most of this is gonna suffer from winter injury. So at this point, you're gonna be able to get access to the plant material, but just be aware that it has not been tested yet and it is not uh, likely to be winter hardy. I bring this up though, that 
the, many of you will ignore me and are going to want to try this and, and great, good. So you guys can go to the expense so we don't have to of testing it. But um, the other thing is uh, Tom has other uh, European selections in the pipeline that have been selected from uh, different regions in Europe that are colder than where this material came from. So we expect better hardiness in some of his future releases. So it's worth paying attention to this material. Um, okay, so you've got the European hazelnut cultivars, then there's the American hazelnut seedlings, and these have typically been widely available to growers in the upper Midwest because they've been uh, produced by the, the Department of Natural Resources, private nurseries, land conservation departments. This is just a, a picture I like to show of in far northern Wisconsin in Bayfield County on the federal lands. It's, you know, hazelnuts as far as the eye can see. So American hazelnut certainly is adapted to our regions. Native, it's, it's disease resistant. Um, the problem is the, the uh, kernels are really almost too small to be commercial. Um, but that said, there's a lot of variation within those populations. And so there are American hazelnut plants that have nice sized kernels. You know, the, we'll, we'll talk more about this kernel size issue, but um, I think more or less the consensus is that these American hazelnuts on average are, are generally just too small. But the yields can be pretty high. You know, a plant like this will be pretty loaded. So if you wanna try these, uh, go ahead, you can get them. They're usually pretty cheap and uh, a good place to start to gain some experience if you can't find uh, trees elsewhere or shrubs elsewhere. And it also will provide a reliable pollen cloud for your planting because these things are adapted to our region. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the uh, hybrid hazelnuts, both the seedlings and the cultivars. And by hybrids, I mean interspecific crosses. These are not, you know, true hybrids like you would think of in corn where they've been using inbreeding. These are interspecific hybrids. So cross between primarily American hazelnut, European hazelnut. But as you'll see, there's parentage from other species in some of the breeding programs. Uh, and the goal is to combine the winter hardiness, eastern filbert blight resistance from our native material with the larger nuts and thinner shells from the European hazelnuts. Now that's, you know, again, we'll talk more about this nut size issue, but this is not necessarily, um, you know, trying to get to European size nuts. It depends on the market. And we're also learning that maybe thinner shells isn't such a, a good thing either when it comes to uh, some of our insect pests. Okay, so hybrid hazelnut seedlings. Right now there are nine suppliers listed on our website. And we try to provide some detail about what they are providing. And there's a number of, of these folks that are going to be presenting as part of our conference today about what they're offering for 2021 and beyond. <clears throat> um, one of the suppliers, Forest Ag Enterprise, uh, provided us with his seedlings way back in 2011. And we've been evaluating those for, well, uh, basically a decade now. And you can find all the performance reports over the years on our website. MidwestHazelnuts.org, and it really gives you a snapshot of how these seedlings perform. And I think it also will give you a sobering uh, look into the limitations that these seedlings have right now in terms of supporting commercial production. If every seedling looked like this, great, but the plant next to it doesn't have any nuts and it hasn't for five years or whatever, right? So there's just so much variability, it makes it hard to be commercial. But there are definitely places where seedlings have a role. As a learner plant, you know, our recommendation, if you've never grown hazelnuts, get seedlings ordered as soon as you can, following Jeff's advice for planting, uh, and plant those and start to learn your production systems. Great for wildlife habit, great for pollen production, essential for pollen production in a lot of ways, because uh, especially uh, the seedlings, you tend to have a wide diversity of pollen shed in the spring, which can help ensure you've got a pollen cloud. You're certainly going to get nut production off these, uh, you know, three, four, five hundred pounds of kernel per acre, which is nothing to sneeze at. Whether you make money growing it, that's another question. But you can certainly get nut production from a hobby or small scale standpoint. Uh, a part that I think folks should think about too is, you know, it's all hands on deck in order to pull off a breeding program uh, in the upper Midwest, especially when we don't yet have an industry to support that breeding program. And so, um, Citizen scientists that grow out seedlings and then evaluate that plant material and identify their best ones for further evaluation is a, is a huge role. And it, in fact, it's has what has been the backbone of the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative, our seedling growers helping us find top plants for propagation. Now I want to put I want to focus on this bullet point here because it's important. Um, 
it's, you know, and it's understandable if you are selling hazelnut seedlings and you are uh, saving seed from your best plant you're planting, you want to tell your customers that, heck, this plant that I saved seeds some from is really good. Large nuts, big yields, does great, right? But you can't make claims about how those offspring are going to perform without having tested those progeny families because you don't know where the pollen came from on those seeds, right? So if you've grown out progeny families, and what I mean is you do what we did with Forest Ag Enterprises where you take a batch of seedlings, you grow them out, uh, they're half sibs, and now we can start to say things about what, uh, what you might expect from seedlings. So just beware if, if people are making performance claims of seedlings, really ask them to see some data that supports their claims. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's just based solely on what that mom plant was doing, and, and it, that's just not good enough. Okay, so th those are the seedlings. Again, there are nine suppliers listed on the website. Uh, supplies are not unlimited, so if you're interested in plant material for 2021, I would for sure uh, act soon, and I'm sure some of the suppliers today will give some updates on their availability. Um, so I want to start out with a, another category that we're starting to do from a seedling standpoint, and this is something that we really didn't set out to do, but it does create a, um, it's, we've done something that really nobody else has been able to do. So each of these trial locations are collections of the top seedling plants that we got from grower, from participate, participating grower breeders. Uh, what we call the germplasm performance trials. It's from these trials that we selected our top cultivars that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but now we're starting to save seed from these top plants and grow those out and make those available to uh, growers. So, you know, if we save a seed from this plant, this plant has been grown at, you know, up to five different locations. And so we're pretty confident that mom is good, right? And across a range of environments. Now we don't know who dad is because we're not doing controlled crosses to any extent yet. We are for breeding purposes, but not for seed production. And so we still don't know what the progeny are gonna perform, but we do feel pretty comfortable or confident that mom is a, is a good producer. If you want access to this plant material starting in 2021, it's going to be through an application process. Uh, and we'll talk later, I guess that's tomorrow, about grower clusters. But uh, you will apply for this plant material in the spring and then based on availability after we sprout these seeds, because this is the first year that this has been available, then it'll, uh, uh, once we have volumes, then we can get it out to folks that have applied. Um, so there's more information about this on our website, but uh, the idea here, and again, you haven't heard about this yet, but you will tomorrow, is to get involved with your nearest uh, network uh, cluster um, in, in order to access this, this plant material. Okay, so um, let's look at hybrid hazelnut cultivars for a second. There are many breeding programs right now. Our breeding program, Grimo Nut Nursery in Ontario, the uh, Hazelnut Consortium, which is uh, Oregon State and Nebraska and Rutgers. Uh, Z's Nutty Orchard is... is with us today, Forest Ag, and there are others as well, uh, that are starting to um, make uh, clonal material of their top plants available to growers. Again, I want to reiterate this testing is hugely important. If folks are selling what they're claiming are good plants, ask them to what extent they've been tested. And that data will help you make a decision about, um, in terms of, say, if you're looking for a plant that has really large nuts, if you're looking for one that's really high yields, you want to make sure that it's adapted to your climate. Only, the only thing that can answer those questions is testing. So it's important to ask that, um, but it's early. You know, it takes a long time to test this material. And so a lot of this, you're gonna have to kind of take a leap of faith and do the testing as you go, because it just, uh, you know, well, as I'll show, we're, we're getting ahead of you, but it's still gonna take time. Uh, just a couple minutes, Jason. So. Yep, just a few slides left. Uh, so these are joint performance trials. Jeff mentioned one of them. Uh, these are the, the red dots that we've started to establish with the top plant material from the various breeding programs, and we have it from four so far, and so we're starting to see some data from this plant material, which will be published. So let's just go quickly through the available plant material. These are the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative selections that are in propagation. Uh, this will be the first one out of the gate, and actually some of this was made available in the fall. This is Eric 421, came from Norm Erickson's plant in near Lake City. Uh, big yields, nice size uh, nuts, and the plant material that you might get available. So these are coming out of tissue culture that are grown for a year, either in a bed and they're lifted in the fall after a year of, or, uh, you know, basically three months of growth. And you can see the root systems or they're grown in pots and 
also made available in the fall. So these are tissue cultured plants that will be available starting 2022. Here's Rose 92, another one of our top ones. Also, it's, it's performing well in tissue culture. And uh, Monar 342, I think Dave and Florence are on the call today. Uh, this is one that's also making its way through propagation. And there's a fourth that I don't have a photo of right now, but so the goal is to get 10 to 12 of these out to growers, but it's just taking time in, in tissue culture. Uh, Grimo Nut Nursery has made a number of selections and um, you can see the nuts that came out of our Madison performance trial. They're really nice. This Northern Blaze in particular is a really nice one. And we, it's only a year of production data in West Madison. Um, but it looks like there's some material that's of interest here. I want to just quickly talk about the Grimo Nut Nursery because Linda won't be joining us in the conference as far as I know. Um, but they, if you go to their website, they have three different um, sources of plant material from which they've been breeding. So the Skinner plant material is the selection from Manitoba, most likely a cross between American Hazelnut and Avalana. Uh, so you can buy seedlings from Skinner or you can buy clonal material of seedlings from Skinner. So Dermis is one that's out there that's available. Then there's heterophylla, which is an Asian hazelnut. It's similar to the American hazelnut, but grows in China. And they had some selections that came to them from Quebec. And from that material, they now have Aldera, Andrew, Hetty, Northern Blaze, and Dawn. Uh, those are, so they come, they have this heterophylla background. Saskatchewan pool is a cross between American hazelnut and some Geneva, New York selections. And no one's exactly clear what came from the Geneva, New York selections, most likely hybrids between American and uh, European. So these three that are highlighted, Northern Blaze, Don and Marion, those are the three that um, Grimo is recommending for the upper Midwest. And from what we've seen so far, Northern Blaze and Marion in the su Southern Wisconsin is doing well. In Northern Wisconsin or up in Northern Minnesota, they have not performed as well and may not be sufficiently winter hardy, but we're not gonna make any firm conclusions on that until a couple more years. Uh, they, their plant availability is very limited. Go to grimonut.com to um, get on their waiting list, basically. Okay, so last slide, um, just wanted to summarize again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on the other breeding programs because they're gonna, they're gonna be talking as part of the conference, but the upper Midwest hazelnuts, we don't have an exact timeline. We will likely start taking orders for 2022 delivery later this spring. We need to see how the plants come out of the winter tissue culture. Um, before we start to, to sell them, uh, but, but that's, it's happening. The Hazelnut Consortium hybrids, the Beast and Grand Traverse are both available. The Beast and the Grand Traverse have not been tested in Wisconsin, Minnesota, except in our joint performance trials. And after three years, we still don't have nut production. And so we're, we're anxious to see how these perform here um, because they haven't been tested yet. Grimo I talked about, and then Nitka from Z's Naughty uh, Ridge um, um, will be discussed later today. So generally, my last statement, if you're a new grower, you've never grown hazelnuts before, I'd highly recommend you buy seedlings, follow Jeff's advice, get them established this year, this fall, or next spring to get experience. And that's going to be really important as you then get on the waiting lists and get access to this, these cultivars so that you, you, so you don't mess up. So you've got a good planting, you've got pollen in the planting, and, and you know how to do this. So kind of a crash course, but again, it's all on our, our website. Uh, in, in more detail. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a question. Let's see, I just lost it here. Um, can you talk briefly and very briefly about the need for multiple clonal material or seedlings for proper pollination? Yeah, so it's an important point. Hazelnuts do not self-pollinate, don't self um, aren't self-compatible, and so you need compatible. So, and it's not just two different varieties to cross. You need two that are compatible and that compatibility is controlled genetically. And in order to know they're compatible, you can either try it and see if it works, or you need to know what the alleles are uh, to know if they're compatible. So when you buy cultivars, it would be great to ask the breeders what those alleles are and hopefully they're known and then make sure that they, um, they're compatible when you plant them. One advantage and what's being recommended is say every sixth row in a planting and the border rows be seedling hazelnuts, which more or less guarantees you're gonna have compatible pollen flying around in that orchard. Um, and you're gonna get pollination regardless of the compatibility of your cultivars. But generally it's best to have compatible cultivars uh, to make sure you get good pollination. 
All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Jason. And um, we're gonna be hearing more from you over the conference timeframe, but uh, thank you for um, your talk this morning. We're gonna go right into Pete Lammers with um, the University of Minnesota Platteville. And he's gonna talk about his pig feeding trials that he's been working on. Um, he's an assistant professor of animal science at Platteville. Um, he teaches a variety of animal nutrition courses and conducts applied pig nutrition research. Today, he'll be sharing the results from ongoing work examining, examining feeding hazelnuts to pigs. Welcome. Um, Pete. Good morning, Linda. Uh, is my screen being shared? Yes. Uh, excellent. All right. You go to slideshow though. We're seeing all your, at the bottom, right? There's a little screen. Yep. Click on that. Here, let me do this. Great. Okay, so I'm Dr. Pete Lammers, teach uh, animal nutrition classes at UW Platteville, and today I'm here to chat about feeding hazelnuts to pigs. Uh, before I get started, really want to acknowledge the collaborators on this project. Uh, they have been many and numerous, and have been very helpful. Four years ago, I knew nothing about hazelnuts other than kind of liked the flavor of them and have learned a lot in the last couple of years about hazelnuts. So in the future, if we are growing large numbers of hazelnut for commercial production, we're going to have a significant bottleneck in terms of what to do with the undersized nuts and those that can't really be processed for human food chains. And so as part of a process to avoid a crash in hazelnut prices, if you will, as well as trying to add value to the existing crop, we have been looking at the nutrient profile of hazelnuts and evaluating it as a feed for pigs. Now, as you would expect, the kernels are very high in fat. Well, that's primarily the reason that we would see growing hazelnuts in a commercial situation as a perennial oil seed. And if we remove the shell, we see that the shell is primarily fiber, still no surprises there. However, with the less than 10 millimeter in-shell hazelnut, we still have fairly significant amounts of fat and less fiber than the shells, but still fairly significant amounts of fiber. I'm gonna focus on feeding the less than 10 millimeter shell, 10 millimeter in shell hazelnut, because what I've been told by those who work with it is these are the nuts that are virtually impossible to separate in a commercial setting. If we compare the nutrient profile of these undersized seeds in shell, to existing pig feeds, we can see that it has considerably more fiber. However, it also has pretty high fat. Um, and so even though it is relatively high fiber, there is still some feeding value perhaps in these hazelnuts. Most interesting to me as a swine scientist and a lover of uh, all good pork meat, is the oleic acid value of in-shell hazelnuts. Oleic acid is one of many fatty acids that are found in various pork products as well as in other feeds. Um, and the in-shell hazelnut actually has an enhanced concentration of oleic acid. That has potential for altering the flavor profile of the resulting pork potentially in a good way. And so the next obvious step after we evaluated the, the nutrient profile of hazelnuts was to actually feed them to some pigs and see what we could find. And so in a pilot project conducted out at the Western Research Farm in Castana, Iowa, we used three deep bedded hoop barns for pigs. We had two, ben, two pens per barn and in each 
pen, we put six barrels. We ran two replicated trials, one in the summer, one in the winter. And in total, each trial had 36 barrels, six pens of six. We started them at 128 pounds, and then we marketed them approximately 10 weeks later. We fed half of the pigs a corn and soybean meal control diet, as well as the other half received the control diet diluted with 10% in shell hazelnuts. The purpose of this trial was to compare hazelnut-fed pig performance to the standard corn soy diets. And for at least in our trial, in order to minimize feed waste and feed sorting, we ground the hazelnuts prior to incorporating into the pig feed. We purchased a small two horsepower roller mill that is primarily marketed to either very small livestock farms or more primarily actually it's a to uh, micro breweries and home brewers who have grown a little bit bigger. Um, but this roller mill was readily available. It wasn't too expensive and it did a fairly good job of processing the in-shell hazelnuts. We found that in order to adequately grind the hazelnuts for incorporation into the pig feed, it worked best to grind them twice. Uh, we would roll them through the roller mill once just to essentially to crack the shell and then we would, would close the gap between the rollers and grind it again. In all, we could do about 200 pounds of hazelnuts in 15 minutes, and we would grind it down to 1,772 microns. The feed particle size matters because in general, the smaller the particle size, the more digestible the feed is. And so, we, we really didn't have a target particle size in mind when we were starting to process these hazelnuts. We were just curious how, what would happen if we ran it through the roller mill. This is what we had. And we saw that we increased the feed particle size by about 200 microns when we diluted the corn soy diet with the 10% hazelnut. On our, based on our research, that isn't, too significant, but we do want to be careful about the blends of hazelnut plus other diets that we're feeding because that is obviously going to impact digestibility and pig performance. If we look at diet appearance, the diet on the left is the experimental diet with 10% in shell hazelnuts, and maybe it does have a little more brownish hue, but frankly, it looks very similar to typical pig feed and we had no issues with the pigs refusing it or um, sorting. Our pigs were fed, or our pigs were weighed every four weeks and feed use was recorded. Following 70 days of feeding, we harvested the first batch in August of 2019. And then we harvested the second batch just before COVID hit in 2020. At harvest, the carcass traits were recorded. We collected two chops per pig, as well as a cube of pork fat from each chop, and we performed quality attributes and fatty acid profile analysis. This table summarizes the growth and performance of pigs fed either a control corn soy diet or the control diet diluted with 10% in shell hazelnuts. And as you can see, even though the diet that included hazelnuts had more fiber, we still achieved similar growth rates and not statistically difference average daily feed intakes. Now, when we take the slightly higher average daily feed intake and the similar growth rate, we did actually have a slightly higher feed to gain ratio, i.e. the pigs fed hazelnuts did grow slightly less efficiently, but they still were within the normal range of what we would expect in our pig production systems. I think this is really important because if we think about the scheduling of pigs, particularly in small markets, the, the bottleneck in producing niche value pork tends to be processing. And currently most of our local processors they are booked solid for at least the next 12 to 18 months. Um, 
at least in my experience, working with the processors locally, as well as talking with farmers who are trying to schedule animals to go into niche markets. Slaughter capacity is a huge concern, but it's not really the topic of today's talk, so I'll move on. If we look at dietary treatments, impact on carcass attributes, very similar carcasses, similar weights, similar fat depth, no real statistical difference in the carcass or the color score or pH. Generally, the higher color score and a higher pH are considered good things, as well as higher marbling percentage. Uh, for the Warner Brats, their shear force and cook loss, we would prefer smaller numbers. But again, there was no real quality attribute difference between the two chops fed the different diets. Where we did see a quality impact or a quantitative difference was in the fatty acid profile of the resulting pork fat. We see that the hazelnut fed pigs had statistically more oleic acid and less palmitic acid that translated into lower saturated fats and more monounsaturated fats. And so the take home from this initial pilot project was that pigs will grow well when fed up to 10% in shell hazelnuts. Processing the hazelnut prior to feeding is important, particularly if we want to, to uh, restrict feed loss as well as support growth rates. Feeding the 10% in shell hazelnuts for 10 weeks maintained pork quality and started to move the fatty acid profile of pork fat in the desired direction. This is just the pilot project, first step of many things that would need to be done in order to develop a long-term sustainable thriving market for in-shell hazelnuts as pig feed. But the next steps are planned for this coming summer. We're hoping to run a small trial looking at the impact of different inclusion rates um, and different lengths of feeding on pork fat and uh, growth performance. The big elephant in the room is the value and opportunity of hazelnut fed pork. Currently, there really isn't a market for hazelnut fed pork. I think there could be. Um, there's just frankly such a small availability of hazelnuts for feeding and then we have less uh, information about the true value of that hazelnut fed pork. And ultimately it's going to come down to customer relations and finding what the customer is ultimately willing to value that particular pork at. Um, that said, I think we've made some good progress towards evaluating hazelnuts as a, pig, as a feed for pigs. And I think this work is definitely going to support a sustainable price for hazelnuts, as well as hazelnut calls and co-products. And if we think about other industries, the primary product is important, but knowing what to do with the co-products and being able to add value is really, really important. And I think this may be a viable enhancement of uh, hazelnuts in the upper Midwest. And so I think that is close to my time that's allowed, but I want to leave a few minutes for questions if there are any. Um, if you would like more information on the study or other nutrition work I'm involved in, by all means, please email or phone. Um, always willing and interested to talk to producers and growers. Thank you, Pete. We do have a couple questions for you. Okay. Um, one is, um, do you know if there's any current or potential research on grazing pigs? I don't know if um, that's anything you get involved with or not. Um, sure. So there, so there's a lot of anecdotal data about grazing pigs. There's very limited controlled research studies here, at least in the U.S. Uh, the work I have seen is coming out of North Carolina. Um, I am actually involved in discussions with local producers about developing projects, looking in Southwest Wisconsin, Upper Midwest at those types of systems. Um, 
I would encourage you to email me directly and I can try to give you better specific information then. Okay, thank you. And then um, we had a question about chickens feeding hazelnuts to chickens. So I don't know if that's your expertise either, but. Um. I feed a lot of animals, a lot of different things. <laughs> um, so I have not had the personal experience of feeding chickens hazelnuts. But I think chickens are an excellent uh, place to feed hazelnuts, particularly the cracked in shell hazelnuts that are not really commercially viable to process further. Um, from my own experience of raising 10 backyard hens for the last three years, they do an excellent job of picking apart uh, various feed products, and I have no doubt that they would gladly sort through a pile of shells for the meats. Um, again, I believe there's a project in Minnesota, The I think it's called the Main Street Project. Yes, they're doing been, chicken feed trials. That's been doing chicken feed projects. There's trials. I'm not, I'm not involved with those, but I'm interested in seeing what those results are. Yeah, they're, I think they're in the second year of that project. So I, I believe it'll be done at the end of this year. So we'll learn more there. Um, then hey, I have Peter's, another, what's, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, Peter, Jason, uh, can you just say a few words about the planned trials for this coming year? Okay, yeah. So the first trial we did, we just fed a large group or a relatively large group of numbers to different diets essentially just to see if we could um, detect any difference at 10%. The next set of trials that we're gonna be working on is a much more refined approach, trying to dial in how much hazelnut do we actually need to include in order to achieve a target fat quality in the pig. And so instead of feeding zero and 10%, we're gonna be feeding uh, we're going to feed 10% uh, just the kernels. I think the pigs on those diets are going to grow really, really well, but I suspect the out of shell kernels are going to be too expensive to do on a, on a wide scale, generally speaking for pigs. We're also looking at 10, 20, and 30% in shell hazelnuts. Again, just trying to get, is, the, is there a break point of how much hazelnut we can feed before we detrimentally impact pork quality, um, trying to get a better handle on, on what that break point is. Okay, thank you. Um, one last question here. Is there a known market benefit for pigs fed hazelnuts? That is, is the pork flavor known to be better? So I think you talked about this a little bit, but. Okay. So the exciting thing about hazelnuts for those in the pig world and those who are really excited about pork meat, <laughs> there's uh, an acorn fed Iberian ham that's, uh, that's market grown and marketed in Southern Spain. And it's valued at $100 per pound. And the main feature or one of the attributes of that high value ham is the extremely high oleic acid content. So in this slide, we have a corn, we have our two diets from this pro, from the previous trial, the one that we did this last summer. And then we have from another research project, the fatty acid profile of some acorn fed pigs and some pigs that were fed a commercial diet. Now, there's a lot more that goes into that $100 a pound ham than feeding acorns, but one of the aspects is the high oleic acid content. Um, and so I think it's been demonstrated that we can create niche products by feeding pigs different things. The big challenge is determining how much hazelnut to feed, what's the sustainable price, and what will the local consumer in the upper Midwest support in terms of pork prices for that specialty product? Okay, well, thank you. I think that uh, pretty
pretty much end our time. We could do one more question if someone had had one. I've gone through all the ones that were sent in the Q and A. Okay. Oh, wait, maybe one more popped up here. Um, what breed are the Iberian pigs? So the pigs that are marketed in this Iberian market, they are a special unique breed indigenous to Southwestern Spain called the Iberian black. It's a pig that by most North American standards is extremely tall, extremely long, extremely poor, weak muscle or small muscled. Um, however, it has evolved Some reason you went blank. Can you still hear me? Do you want to check your microphone settings in the bottom left corner, Pete? You're muted. Pete, you're muted. You're still muted. Oh, there I'm sorry. Go. So I lost audio if there was a follow up question there, but. Okay, I do have a follow up question. Um, it's about Nyman Ranch. What is Nyman Ranch's opinion so far? So I'm not sure what that's exactly asking. Sure. Well, Nyman Ranch is a buyer of, of and processor of pigs raised for niche markets. Um, they've been they've been supportive of the project. They were a collaborator on the processing end. Um, I think they are also curious, um, but I, I can't really speak about them at this point. Okay. And um, I think that's all the, the questions I have. So thank you very much. And um, we'll use this time to recognize our 2021 Hazelnut Farmer of the Year. Um, you can see on the slide that um, Norm Erickson was the Hazelnut Farmer of the Year in 2019. And Jim Mickelson from Rochester was the Farmer of the Year in 2020. So this year we have another Minnesotan, Don Price from Northfield, Minnesota, is our 2021 Hazelnut Farmer of the Year. Don has been raising hazelnuts since 2008 and has been very interested in the research aspects. He's collaborated with um, Lois and Jason on, the, on uh, some research on his farm. And he's been especially interested in uh, nut quality, including the taste and how it feels in your mouth, your mouth feel. And so that's been very helpful. In 2010, he identified two selections to advance um, to the research trials. And one of the two selections are in the current list of the top eight. And um, when Jason was speaking, um, he showed that that selection that was from Don's farm. Um, he's been very helpful with his research plantings, having needed supplies ready when Lois visited and um, was doing her research there. Also, Don was one of the founding members of the Minnesota Hazelnut Foundation. Um, I'm not sure when that was, back quite a while ago. Um, anyway, um, I think Don's one of our participants today. I don't know if he wants to say any words. Um, I should point out we have a, a nice trophy. I'm just going to hold this up by my picture um, on the video. It's a, a cap with a special batch of hazelnuts glued to it to recognize the hazelnut farmer of the year. And I'll send this over to you, Don, and so you can uh, wear it proudly in your neighborhood. 
Thank you and congratulations. Mike Loveland. And I have his bio here somewhere. So Mike Loveland has worked with Midwestern BioAg Company since 1990 as a soil health farm consultant, currently consulting on 120 farms, growing row crops, dairy, beef, vegetable growers, vineyards, and one hazelnut producer. Currently about one third are certified organic crop production. The soil and I thank you for this opportunity to share my love of soil health with your group. All right, Mike, I think we're ready to go here with your presentation. So you can just go ahead when you're ready. Mike, you, you need to swap your screens though. We're seeing your display settings in the upper left. Next one over. The next one to the right. To the right. Display settings. Next one. There's a little down arrow beside the one that says display settings. There you go. Yep. Swap. There you go. Great. Mike, you're muted, I think. Okay. Once again, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I'm pretty excited to uh, be able to present to you some of my, uh, my passion and my love of uh, building soil health for uh, farm families and farmers. Uh, soil health is... Uh, it's it's getting a lot of good press lately in the magazine articles. You probably read about it about you know cover crops, uh, building the, uh, the the health of the soil, and um, it, we've been actually doing this since I I was farming kind of organically back in the '70s with my our dairy farm. We had 150 cows, and um, my egg instructor down at Winona Votech was uh, Gary Zimmer. And he's quite influ in influential um, as far as promoting uh, natural farming systems, uh, which sometimes the organic is a, really a way of marketing. Uh, but it, uh, I guess the biological farming is what we would call it. It's putting more life back into the soil. So I'll just uh, get along here with, uh, so I push my slide. Um, uh, just, I, I don't do this every day, it's, it's put up with me. To, uh, to get the next slide, um, do I push um, arrow down or? Uh... You should be able to control it right along the top. There's arrows. Okay. Um, let's see here. I... I think arrow down will do it. Okay. Um, Let's or see. the left and right arrow should do it as well. Yeah. Um, hmm. Let's see here where, um, now let's try it. Okay, there we go. Okay. Had the mouse, uh, was interfering. So, yeah, so just a little background about Midwestern BioAg. It was started uh, by my ag teacher, Gary Zimmer, uh, founded in 1983. Uh, we currently um, have around 4,500 customers, about a million acres, uh, and our retention numbers are pretty good at 87%. A lot of farmers are getting older, they retire, and some, and then they might rent their farm out, and then we sometimes will lose a customer. Um, so uh, we have a, quite a diverse crop experience. Um, our goal is to, uh, you know, work with any, any crop production uh, will benefit from soil health. And so we, we don't have to just target corn and beans or alfalfa. Um, about 30% of my customer base are cer currently certified organic. So our, our inputs, uh, we, we handle both conventional and organic. And um, I, I guess a lot of, um, there's some, you know, there's some 
challenges when we do that. And so we, we work hard to make sure that uh, we maintain the organic uh, quality control. 65% um, grow row crops. Uh, we have a large number of dairies we work with. Uh, and then we do work, I work with some vineyards. Uh, the company we, you know, with 10 to 20% would be specialty crops and vegetables. Okay, so um, when we talk about soil health, I guess I was kidding my farmers when I, you know, come onto the farm, uh, I said, really, my job is to take uh, something that looks like pumpkin pie soil and turn it into chocolate cake. And then we all laugh. And, uh, but really, if you look at this particular photograph, uh, we do have a texture here that's, that resembles I, I, what I would call chocolate cake. It's got a lot of air in it, good, good um, oxygen carrying capacity, good water uh, holding capacity. And um, so um, there's not just one, in, there's not a, a fertilizer ingredient that'll make that happen. And that's the message I wanna get out today that it's a combination of a lot of management factors. Uh, input certainly will help assist the program. And that's the direction that you know, I'll be talking about today as well as how do we you know, really build uh, soil health. Um, here's an example of a couple examples of poor soil health, um, you know, poor drainage there on the lower side of the bean field. Um, then we run into some sodic soils in South Dakota uh, that can really interfere with, um, with germination. You can see the, the, the crust forming there. Uh, the soil is just kind of void of a soil life. Um, and you can see where the rainfall that comes down might be running off instead of soaking in. And, uh, so just a kind of example of some poor examples of, of, of what we're trying to eliminate. And uh, this little wheel here, it's, it's really, um, I love, it really kind of uh, shows us there's um, three components to a soil. There's the chemical, which we usually measure with soil testing. There's the physical, and that would be kind of like uh, uh, the, the, you know, the air and water movement through the soil. And then there's the biological, and that would be the life component of the soil. Sometimes uh, people would call it maybe the organic matter content. I like to think of it as the, there's a certain percentage of humus that's in organic matter. And a lot of times soil labs have a hard time of uh, extracting or identifying how much humus is in the organic matter. And so, um, We'll get into that talking about uh, what are some other measurements on a soil test that would indicate um, good biological activity. Um, now, when I, when I do farm as a farmer, I would use this wheel, this uh, three part wheel to say, when I go out and buy a piece of tillage equipment, um, how is it gonna affect my chemical portion of my soil? How is it gonna affect the physical? How is it gonna, great enhance biological or will it destroy biological. So you can use this wheel to use on all of your uh, the kind of, of a thinking tool about which inputs you should be buying, what kind of mechanical equipment you should be buying. And um, I just think it, it'll, uh, it'll make you a little bit better as a biological farmer to take all three of these concepts and apply it to a lot of your decision making. Um, let me just see here. So organic matter, um, you know, there's, there's, um, as, as we see here, uh, the soil is made up of 25% uh, water, approximately 25% air and 45% minerals and 5% uh, organic matter, soil life, odds and ends. So you can see about 50% of what we're farming out here is air and water. It's the most precious ingredient that we use on our crops whether we're growing hazelnuts or um, soybeans or corn or hay or grass. Um, now, if we were to, um, you know, expand the water to say, you know, a wet year, say 35, 40% water, then we're gonna crowd out the, the air spaces typically, and we will crowd out some of the mineral uptake. So there's a, you know, kind of a balance here. And I know we had, the previous speaker talked about, you know, getting your soil types, uh, finding out what kind of drainage it has. Uh, hazelnuts, uh, I hear, you know, don't do well with wet feet. Um, I've got farms up in the St. Cloud area that where they've incorporated tiling in their area and that we can really increase uh, crop yields when we have uh, plenty of oxygen. The fertilizers become more effective 
in the presence of oxygen. And so that's a really an important part of the, of the organic cycle. Um, so then the living org organisms um, make up a part of the soil organic matter, which is uh, just 5% of the to total structure. Uh, one of our measuring sticks would be that when I get, when I feel I've made my, I've completed my job is when I get 30 to 40 earthworms per cubic foot of soil, like in August, you know, under kind of a little better soil conditions than what if, if it was real dry, of course, they're going to go deep. If it's cold, they're going to go deeper. And um, I was, I had the opportunity to study uh, a professor, uh, he was called a worm doctor, uh, Dr. Clive Edwards. Um, I believe he was out of the University of Indiana. And he's got a lot of books written on the, on the, the makeup of earthworms, you know, how they multiply. Uh, what we don't realize is that uh, an earthworm has got the stomach of a cow and of a pig in that they, uh, they uh, burrow through the soil, they eat the soil, and then it, what comes out the back end um, is homogenized. It's been, you know, they got a gizzard, it's been chewed up. So they can really improve your soil structure just doing their life processes. Um, the 40, the 30 or 40 earthworms per cubic, cubic foot, but also they, uh, Dr. Clive was saying that, uh, you know, we could probably get a 60 to 80 units of nitrogen just from dead dying earthworms uh, because they're extracting mucus. And uh, so that's just, you know, some of the benefits you can see here in this picture, there's earthworm holes. And um, when earthworms come to the surface, they'll have a casting that they a little like on top of the burrow. And that casting will have many more times of available phosphorus and uh, potassium and calcium than the original soil started out with. So they, they really help to homogenize and make minerals that are tied up and make them really bioavailable for the growing crop. So I think we all agree having earthworms in, in, a, in a soil is going to really add to your soil health. Then um, the soil health is uh, versus uh, soil fertility. Um, soil health is going to, you know, it's going to aid in the permeability of the soil structure, the biology. Uh, that I, uh, Gary, I always wanted us to ex ex give a description of soil fertility. And I think the best one we came up with is that it's the maximum level of nutrients that are exchangeable in the soil for optimum crop performance. And so it's a measurement of nutrients, uh, pH, C, C, we'll get into that. So <clears throat> I think the, the key word there is exchangeable. And the soil health, the soil life has a big part in making your, your soil test numbers become available to the plants that are growing. Um, so um, once again, we got a three-legged stool symbolizing the balance between uh, if, we, if all we do is put on chemical components without looking at the physical and the biological, we'll have an uneven stool. It'll be one leg will be longer than the other two. And it, uh, it's all about balance. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's what we try to achieve. Okay, I got to get rid of this upper thing here. Okay, healthy soil. Uh, how do we measure it? Well, um, recently, there, you know, in the NRCS, there was where they would take men's under cotton underwear, and you bury it in your soil in the top six inches. And then um, you, do that, you do that on several spots around your farm. And then the, you dig it up, say, three months later, and uh, the underwear that's you know, devoured by the organisms is a really good indicator of soil health. I, I kind of chuckled at, you know, it's a, probably a pretty good way of evaluating. Uh, one, one of the things, the tools that I look at is the crop residues. How uh, can we tell what was growing there the year before? Uh, do we have poor residue breakdown? Or do we, can we not tell what was growing the previous year, which would be our goal? Um, we need to feed the soil life. Uh, there, uh, they say that there's around six to 8,000 pounds of living organisms under every acre of healthy soil. So I would convert that to say, you know, six or eight beef cows under every acre. What are we doing to feed our six cows per acre? Um, and that's where I'm gonna get into uh, Recycling the, the, the tissues, the, the, the clippings from the, the alleyways, uh, feeding the soil life, all kinds of green plant material along with the woody material would really aid in, in the diet of our soil uh, life. Okay.
Next, <clears throat> next slide here. Let's see here. What am I doing wrong? Okay, <clears throat> this slide is demonstrating the effect if we can increase organic matter 1%, uh, we'll be sequestering the carbon um, on a 550 acre uh, farm. Uh, or was it five? I gotta, let me get rid of this. Uh, on a 500 acre farm, it's, it's like taking 2,000 cars off the road. Um, so that is just a, you know, kind of a demonstration of a lot of our carbon that we uh, put on top, the organic matter that we leave on top of the soil um, could oxidize. And, we, and then we, our, our job as biological um, uh, farms is to sequester that carbon. Let's try to recycle the residues back into the soil where the, the microbes can convert it into plant usable nu uh, nutrients. Let's see here, next slide. Okay, um, <clears throat> why the soil health matters, um, resiliency and readiness. Um, one thing I, when I was in the seventies, we had a, a natural farm fertilizer dealer come around the country and he was saying how the, you know, there actually is in a teaspoon, in a tablespoon of healthy soil, there's more organisms than on the planet earth. And this slide kind of demonstrates that 1 billion bacteria in a gram of soil, we know there's 454 grams in a pound. So we could have 454 billion bacteria in a pound of soil. It's massive presence. And that's where, um, when we have those different organisms and the, the variability of the organisms, those populations can be, they can be harmed and they can diminish, but the diversity of the, bio life, the biological life, it'll stop one pest from taking over and doing real damage to the crop. So um, that's the, the benefit of diversity of the biological life in the soil. Um, it may reduce some of the need for the spraying of, the, I would assume they're meaning that the herbicides. Um, it prepares the soils for a conversion to organic. Uh, so, so I got farms that are, you know, converting to organic and it just uh, really aids if we can have that soil life up and running. Okay. Um, for every 1% increase in soil organic matter, an acre's water holding capacity increases 20,000 gallons. Well, that's phenomenal, and, uh, and uh, it, it, so that 20,000 gallons, of course, that's gonna be held in the soil in these open air spaces that are in like a chocolate cake soil, will have less ponding, will have less runoff, erosion, reduced leaching. <clears throat> There's many ways to build a soil health, and I think uh, these cover it. I think uh, I'm really um, excited about what we're seeing with growing cover crops, and as a hazelnut grower, uh, you folks will have a tremendous opportunity to, in your alleyways to, uh, to grow cover crops. Um, I, uh, I think uh, clipping the cover crop when it's young and succulent and throwing that under the, under the trees to aid in the breakdown of the, of the carbon, the higher carbon type materials uh, from the previous prunings would really aid in the, in the breakdown. So I really like the idea of uh, somehow of uh, when you do have these grassy, legume grass based the cover crops to blow those uh, materials um, back under the say a 10 foot swath under the trees um, <clears throat> you're going to really see a benefit of soil building to feed that soil life um, <clears throat> so that <clears throat> a diverse rotation um, i think in the hazelnut alleys i could see us maybe up grading those every six or seven sixth year or seventh year you might want to work it up the alleys and reseed um, um, another, a new, uh, new and improved species of cover crop materials. Um, they do tend to, over time, they'll get, they'll thin themselves out because of uh, weather and, uh, and uh, tr wheel traffic and uh, that type of thing. <clears throat> and then, of course, um, we try to apply a balanced plant nutrition 
Uh, we also want to look at, uh, and that's something we're going to get into here, crop uh, quality crop inputs. Um, we want to use uh, life enhancing inputs instead of inputs that would kill or harm the soil life. We, uh, we might want to, with hazelnuts, there's not really a whole lot of tillage needed other than this when you establish the hazelnut grove. <clears throat> and of course, the timely planting and harvesting um, that can affect if we're, we don't want to be out there then less than ideal conditions cause if it's too wet will cause uh, compaction. And of course, that will take the oxygen out of the soil and that'll kill off. The, it'll make the soil life go dormant until things improve. Um, hazelnut growers would have a, with through fencing could perhaps do some intensive grazing uh, in these alley areas. And I know the previous speaker was saying maybe 12 or 15 foot alleys between the, the trees. I would say that would be great. Um, and then maybe we could, uh, if we had some sheep or goats, or if we wanted to have some calves out there to, to graze, that would be um, a value added uh, process. <clears throat> So uh, cover crops, uh, there's what we've known is that a 1% increase in organic matter will, will add uh, 10,000 pounds of soil carbon or 1,000 pounds more nitrogen per acre. Not all that will stay in the soil, of course, so it, but it is a positive thing. It increases soil water holding capacity um, and it, it, it will help to remove that 15 to 20 tons of carbon from, carbon from the atmosphere. Hey, Mike, I have a question about um, that slide you just had up. Yes. Um, that came in from the audience. Um, so when you're looking at, um, well, the reference was to those 2,000 cars removed so much um, oh, yeah. carbon from the atmosphere. So it was like the bottom on what you had on that previous slide. Um, this one here, 1% 1 increase in organic matter on a 500 acre farm is like taking 2,000 cars off the road. Okay, so what period of time is that relevant to? Is that annually? Yeah, I would say to get there, you know, to have your farm, uh, a lot of my farms, we may get a 1% increase over five to seven years. So it's, it's, it's a slow process, but it all depends too on how much we can put back, how much biomass we can put back into the soil to... Um, and then what, that all that raw organic matter from the let's say the plant residues, the 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 the, the pruning of, of the hazelnuts, those materials, you know, the finer we can reduce the particle size uh, and then return that back to the soil, the faster it'll turn. What I really what we're really after is to uh, produce more humus out of the organic matter, and um, the humus is uh, we'll get into that. It's about a three hundred cec where our soils might be around a 10 CEC. The holding capacity of humus is, is huge. And um, so I think that, you know, that process um, you know, will take time. Now, if we're a row crop farmer and we don't return a whole lot back to the soil, uh, let's say we're selling off you know, corn stalk bales, that organic matter, it may never increase. But you know, there's farming techniques and practices that we can do to really affect the organic matter increase on, on a soil. Well, with perennials, you should have maybe higher organic matter to, anyway. Yes, um, my producer, my hazelnut producer, he admits that he uh, was uh, burning. He was taking all the prunings to the end of the, ed the edge of the field and burning them. And then uh, now he's, you know, we were figuring out, well, maybe we should bring those ashes back and, and place that under the trees, which would be, you know, nice. I think we're losing a lot of carbon through the burning process. We're not sequestering as much carbon as we could. So I would say <coughs> I, he, we're both looking at getting uh, uh, a, a, a chipper shredder behind a, on a three-point hitch behind our small tra garden tractor. And we're going to shred all these uh, prunings and blow them right back into the, under the trees. And then if we clip our green uh, alleyways, that green plant succulent material will mix in with those uh, woodier particles and that'll aid the soil life in breaking down so we get a better nitrogen to carbon ratio. And so anytime we put a dead dying woody stuff into the soil, we're gonna rob the plants of nitrogen that we maybe want to grow in that soil because we, out, that we have to remember the microbes always eat first. And so if we were to uh, put down too much straw or um, 
you know, woody material into the soil, the soil is going to have to give up some of its uh, nitrogen to break that down in order so the microbes can consume it. So that's why I really like the idea of taking the green alleyway cover crop material and blowing it onto our mulch that might be under our trees. You can see where that nitrogen to carbon ratio would be greatly enhanced to speed up the, the breakdown of the organic matter into true humus, which is true mm -hmm. plant food. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and then as I, I guess, you know, a systems approach, um, I wanna, I'm not sure if I totally understand the slide, but <laughs> this was done by some, uh, some science at, guys at the BioWay company, but um, it's, it, uh, I do understand the, the, the barrel, the, 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 the picture of a barrel stave and, a, and the, new, the soil can only, the yield potential can only be as high as the lowest stave in that barrel with each stave being, a, say a fertilizer ingredient or um, microbes. And so the lack or excess, the lack or excess of a single plant growth factor can limit yield potential. A deficiency in just one of the 17 nutrients essential to crop growth can limit the yield. So that's why we soil sample. I, I have a little t-shirt that says, don't guess soil test. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, bodes well to, uh, to get maximum uh, soil health. And uh, okay. And what's limiting your yield? Well, a system approach evaluates all factors uh, of production and maps a plan for continuous improvement. Uh, what changes can you make? What tools does it require? And what is the return on investment? So I think there again, we got this uh, thought process. Can we, you know, can we identify some places where we can make improvements? I know for my, my, my hazelnut grower, he's gonna, he wants to really buy a, a, a chipper shredder to reduce particle size of his tree trimmings and return that back into the soil under the trees. Um, then, you know, how are we gonna, um, we had to plan for that. Um, uh, then we, you know, we need to execute the, the actual, you know, let's actually do it. And then, that's, then after we do it, let's follow up with, let's evaluate and see, you know, and so that's how we all grow as farmers. We can all become better, better uh, you know, food producers um, as we go forward. Management, limiting factors. <clears throat> Here you can see some, you know, these guys probably thought this would be a good day to go out and work up some soil and uh, boy, the soil wasn't ready for it. Um, so many factors beyond plant nutrition can impact yield. Um, the input replacement, uh, we call it root recovery of our uh, nutrients. So it's very important. The timing of when we do the, the, the planting or the, the feeding of the plants the tillage method, um, are we gonna go too deep and um, bring up a lot of dead soil or are we gonna go too shallow so we, we, don't, we don't break up the hard pan that might be limiting the amount of air and water going moving through the soil. Uh, planting timing, if, are we planting in cold soil or is it gonna be an, I would say, you know, 60 degree soil temperature would be optimum for germinating seeds or to get plant growth. Um, and then crops, we follow that up then with crops scouting. What are, what are, the, what are the crops telling us? <clears throat> Plant nutrition, a deficient, like we were saying uh, earlier, uh, a deficiency in just one of the 17 nutrients can limit yield. Um, so that's kind of, um, so if we identify and correct the nutrient deficiencies, and that's what we're going to get into here next. Now, um, so this is, uh, this is uh, an example of, uh, we use Midwest uh, soil labs in Omaha, Nebraska. And what we have, we, uh, we've been with them for 35 years. And it's kind of like when you work with a lab and you're doing consulting work with these extraction numbers on a piece of paper, the consultant that interprets the extraction, the numbers on the page is just as important as the lab that, that did the extractions. And I always kid my wife that uh, because I've been married to this lab now for 30 years, I really am starting to understand the lab and how they and how my recommendations affect soil health and, and crop productivity. And um, there's one thing I wanted to point out on soil on soil sampling versus tissue testing. Uh, tissue tissue sampling analysis is standardized throughout all labs. They're very accurate between labs. Now soil sampling. Uh, when you go to labs, they all have a different extraction process. It's not standardized. 
And so that's why the numbers on the paper are really hard for me to do soil correctives. I can do crop fertilizer on any lab, but when I wanna do soil correctives, such as lime and phosphorus, um, I'll probably rely on Midwest labs to tell me, you know, so I have a, I understand how the, the numbers were uh, extracted. It's not saying that, you know, there's good labs or bad labs. It's just that the person interpreting the lab results is very important that they have, you know, at least a five or 10 year history of making recommendations from those extractions from the, from a particular lab. Uh, most labs do a really good job at telling you if it's high, medium, or low for an element. And that's where I would use any lab to do f crop fertility. So at, at Midwestern BioWake, we separate out crop fertility is a little is different than, than, than soil correctives. So a soil corrective would be the big things. They usually come in semi loads to the farm. It might be a long term investment to build the soil as far as you know, pH, lime and then the, the, the phosphorus. Uh, rock phosphate is my preferred source for woody plant materials that are long, they're in the, they're in the soil for many years. Uh, <clears throat> trees and shrubs, when we get over here to phosphorus, um, uh, they want their uh, nutrients slow. Uh, and then uh, like, for instance, if we were to use uh, DAP 1846O as a phosphorus source, those are really meant to be put next to the seedling at corn and it's pretty much uh, available maybe for six or 10 weeks after planting. And of course, for hazelnuts, we want, uh, you know, years of phosphorus availability. We don't want it all available right away that first year. Um, so what, what we have here, I'm going to spend a little time here on this. We have field A, field B, and field C. <clears throat> I just, you know, um, I just want to point, the first things that I look at is the CEC. That tells me the holding capacity. It tells me like the four, uh, field C has got a 4.6. That means it's sandy soil. Um, field B is a 17.2 CEC. And that would be more a very uh, clay, a small particle clay soil. And um, there's, I just want to point out that there's no right or wrong CEC. It's just that we need to know the CEC in order to know how many pounds of product to apply at one time so that it's there and not, and so it doesn't leach away because sand, of course, whatever you pour on it in the morning, you may drink in your well a couple of days later. So the, the holding capacity of sand is very, uh, very light. It's, it's, it, does, it doesn't have the exchange sites where a, a clay soil will have a lot more surface area of particles for the nutrients to adhere to. And so that's why the, <clears throat> the CEC is it's so important to know that. And like I say, there's, there's no right or wrong. It's just that myself as a soil consultant, it'll have a great effect as to how many pounds we apply at one time to make a correction. And the next thing I would look at is pH. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we know that soil life prefers a pH of 6.6 six to 7.2. I call that the life zone. So that, that optimum pH for um, microbe um, populations to thrive in. Um, I, 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 I do a lot of dairy nutrition work and uh, dairy nutritionists for years have known they had to control their rumen pH for optimum microbial production that the cows actually live on. <clears throat> so as you can see here, field C, a little lighter soil, uh, 6.3 pH. It's just um, not, it doesn't have quite the atmosphere conditions in the soil to support life. Um, the soil has, uh, when plants grow, they give off hydrogen in exchange for a cation, which is uh, cations are positive charge elements. You can see pot potassium, magnesium, calcium, and hydrogen are all positive. Uh, there's plus signs on that soil test. <clears throat> so um, when plants grow and they're really growing good, they give off a, a hydrogen, and then in, in exchange they take up they take up a cation, and whatever ratio those ki those cations are in is what the plant gets. So on our soil test, uh, you'll see there's just, there's a dark blue area, um, a desired level under each uh, soil. Um, 
so like, and then sometimes uh, you'll see that they're kind of all the same. The potassium, we like to have soil potassiums, base saturation between three to 5%. A lighter soils like sand, I might go from five to 7%. So that would, our lab is not, uh, the programming is such that it doesn't auto correct for that. So on this particular field C, I would say a potassium range should be five to seven. It's at 4.7, so it's, it's pretty close. But it, and then, um, and, and then, oh yeah, the base saturations here. So that the desired level is, it doesn't matter what crop you're growing. When you have this desired level, um, those uh, percentages were, um, was, was, there was a soil micro, uh, soil biologist in, uh, from the St. Cloud, Missouri. Um, uh, I'm trying to think now. Oh my gosh. Um, anyhow, he, he did a rabbit study. He took hay samples from all the different counties around St. Louis. And um, his question was, what cation balance will give me the most rabbit meat, will give me the most flesh on a rabbit? And through his research of all these different uh, ratios of cations, from the, he would take a soil test from the hay that he fed to rabbits. And then he came up with this um, Dr. Albright, that's his name, Dr. Albright. And, uh, and so we at BioAg, we found that with his, with his numbers of 3 to 5% potassium, 12 to 16% magnesium, and 70 to 75% calcium is optimum cation balance to put more digestible fiber into our forages that we feed our cattle. And, and, uh, and that, that also in, means that we were also, in, uh, we're seeing an explosion of soil life with these type of ratios. So our job then is when we, how do we get balance in the soil? Well, um, field A, we can see it's a 6.1. It's a little high in potassium. They may be an over applied manure. They might've had a renter that just poured on a lot of potash. Uh, his calcium is pretty good. He's, you know, 73. Um, his magnesiums are a little high and um, his uh, pHs are good. If we go over to his um, uh, potassiums, um, P2 for a hazelnut grower, I think P2 is really an important extraction. It's a stronger, what the lab did is they use a stronger acid to pull out the ex, all the phosphorus in the soil sample. And um, then the P1 then is a weaker acid. And so we know that if we have a good biological activity, the P2 will help supply the P1 and make it will have more will actually have an increase of uh, soil test numbers by increasing the biological activity, which will increase the, the available, turning that um, not so available uh, phosphorus into more plant available form. And uh, the soils have a lot of phosphorus in them. Um, I believe it's up to 40,000 pounds of phosphorus. <clears throat> so anyhow, that's, I, well, I don't wanna get too deep here, but I just wanted to point out a couple things here. Um, so we have, um, we have the, the pHs here indicated that the field C would probably do well with one ton of, of uh, high calcium lime because his magnesiums are, are already too high at 16. I mean, they're at 31, they should be under 16. So a dolomitic lime, uh, which is kind of like a two parts calcium, one magnesium would not fit that very well. Uh, a calcitic lime being like a 35 to one ratio of calcium to magnesium would fit that farm a lot better. So, um, so when we get a soil test back, it'll kind of tell us at BioAge we offer five different uh, forms of calcium, and a lot of it is dictated by the soil test. And, uh, and in this situation, uh, um, excessive magnesium and uh, low calcium, I would probably uh, put on some calcitic lime. And then um, magnesium, uh, if we talk about magnesium, it uh, that element is a very small molecule as opposed to the calcium molecules are quite large. So magnesium has a, a has kind of a, a tightening effect to the soil. We'll get back to that uh, pumpkin pie structure. And if we keep the calcium levels higher than uh, in that 70, 75% and magnesium 12 to 16, that will allow for us to have more oxygen carrying capacity. And uh, I call it a bigger lung system in that soil to support soil life. Soil life, they need to have air exchange. Uh, they take two breaths a minute, uh, 30 seconds between breaths. Um, 
Um, and so that's where um, if we curtail our, if we have wet soils, poor drainage, um, then we lose the soil life and then we lose the, the effectiveness of our fertilizers that we're buying. Um, hey Mike, we have a question that came in about if, um, if you're recommending a foliar calcium product or yes um what you guys I, use? Mm -hmm. I understand yeah um i tell you the when we work with these uh, calcium based saturations uh the most uh, cost effective treatment is to bring in a you know a, a truckload of, of of lime and we're talking you know three to say two to two thousand uh, eight thousand pounds per acre now um if i see where i would place a liquid calcium like calcium nitrate is a good source when i see a crop growing and all and there might be a spot in the field where uh, we see that it's got a calcium deficiency while it's growing i love to bring in a, a fast acting liquid uh, calcium nitrate will really um, you know it'll put a band-aid on the problem until we can get that area of the field corrected uh, with the soil test so yes, there's times when we use the, the liquid calciums. It's just that the, the cost per unit of, 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 of uh, uh, well, let me back up. You know, there's, there's calcium as an element and then there's calcium carbonate that's used to correct pH. So at BioAg, we have a lot of different calcium sources that we call fertilizer grade calcium where we would bring in a, a liquid calcium to feed the plant directly, or we would burn the lime, we get rid of the carbonate. It's the carbonate in lime is what really moves the pH more so than uh, the calcium. Uh, magnesium actually moves pH more effectively than calcium does. All three cations, uh, calcium, potassium, magnesium, will all affect pH and, um, in a positive way. You know. So um, I think I answered that. Um, so there's times when we want to when we want to put a, apply a foliar calcium to bring to rescue a crop, but I would never use. I would look at it. I would look at it as only a band aid. It would not be the overall correction that's needed, because uh, we'll continue to have those those issues then moving forward. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, and then um, there's some indicators I had talked earlier about uh, indicators of soil health. Um, the the, um, the the phosphorus to iron is uh, are two numbers that I look at. So let's just take uh, field B. Uh, fit, he's got 56 parts per million of uh, P2, and the iron is at um, 23. That's a good sign. I always want the phosphorus to be higher than the iron. Uh, P2, I want P2 phos to be higher than the iron. And if we look here, um, field... Um, uh, field C, it's got 74 parts per million of iron, and this P2 is only 41. In that, in that scenario, what's happening in the soil is we have an oxidizing, a rusting in environment, which is, does not promote biologic, healthy biological uh, life in the soil. So how do we correct that? Um, I, in, in a hazelnut world, we would be applying uh, soft rock phosphate, um, I can get into the math of how, in this case, we're, um, we're at 41 on P2. I'd like to be about 75. So we're about 30, 30, 30 parts per million short. And then to convert that 30 million, uh, 30 parts per million that we're short, we take that times 4.6 to convert it to a P2O5. So that soil C is short 138 pounds of uh, P2O5. Soft rock phosphate is around 23 pounds per hundred of total phos, so I would divide that by 23. So it would take 600 pounds per acre of soft rock phosphate to bring to over over the next, uh, you know, uh, uh, it'll probably take you know three to six years for that to assimilate. But that uh, 600 pounds would is was what I'm doing on my hazelnut groves on a farm that would have this it, where he would be under say 40. 40 parts per million, we want to be up in that 100, 75 to 100. Um, woody, woody type plant materials like hazelnuts and growth, uh, they're heavy feeders on phosphorus and, um, and also potassium because they're building, you're removing, when you prune, you're removing, like in this, in my customer, he removed the, 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 the prune cutting, the pruning cuttings to the end of the field and burned them and then never put the minerals back. So 
one of the fixes I did with him is we're, we're adding 800 pounds of soft rock to his fertilizer program. Um, and un until, and we might do that um, each year for say three or four years, and then we'll resample. And at that time, we'll determine if we're done with, uh, with the rock foss. And so uh, um, um, for those that have never seen a soil test, uh, parts per, if you take the, pound, the parts per million times two equals pounds per acre. And these are all these extractions are in the like potassium is in the elemental form. So, like on field A, we're 248 parts per million. You take that times two is pounds per acre. So, it'd be about 500 pounds per acre. And then, um, uh, where's it going with that? Um, so in, in, uh, in crop production, we want to see that at a minimum of, uh, say, 125 to 150 parts per million would be kind of the, the low threshold. Uh, you can see there in field C, we're at 84 parts per million on sandier soil. I would recommend, you know, do, putting on maybe three applications of potassium during the growing season because we know the soil just cannot hang on to it very long, where these heavier soils field A and field B especially, um, they're not going to really, um, the, uh, field B is at 1.7 on potassium, 113. We, put, we have a target range there of 201 to 335 under field B there under potassium. And so that would be the, the range, the goal, the range. So that'll give me an indication of how much crop fertilizer it's going to take to, um, to maintain the soil test and, and, and have increased crop yields. Um, so I think, um, the, the ratios of the next, the other ratio I wanted to point out was, uh, calcium to potassium. <clears throat> we always like to have calcium be 10 times higher than potassium. So like, um, if we look at, um, field A, we're at 248 on potassium. So his calcium to have a 10 to one would be, have to be 2,480 pounds. And he said 1525 or she. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, you can see where even though the, the calcium is 73% base saturation, because of that high potassium, the, the, wood, the plants are going to be really woody. Um, there's going to be less hemocellulose uh, fiber uh, in that uh, plant. Um, so we, we can kind of fertilize for quality if we m monitor our, um, our mineral levels and our ratios. And um, I'll just looking here. Um, Field B, uh, 113 on potassium, 1.7% potassium. So it's low on potassium. He's got enough calcium out there for 210. If you look at the 2109 uh, parts per million of calcium on field B, um, that means that he could go up to 210 on potassium from 113. So we have a lot of room there to add additional potassium without having to worry about uh, bringing on more calcium to go with it. Um, so that's how we... That's how we look through a soil test and we kind of build a, a fertility program um, based on these soil tests. Then if you look down below on the, on the trace minerals, zinc, manganese, uh, actually sulfur, we'll talk about, I'll talk about sulfur next, but you know, the, the trace minerals, zinc, manganese, iron, copper, and boron, those we, we don't ever want to get luxury levels. So those I, I'd rather just add that to the fertility program and spoon feed it because these elements are so expensive. A lot of them are over $2,000 a ton and you only probably use, you know, 10 or 20 pounds per acre. But uh, we just, uh, we always make sure that we put a nice balanced homogenized uh, trace pack down with our dry fertilizer blends. So the crop, uh, it mainly just to do for crop removal, not to really get, my goal on, on the traces are not to get a pretty soil test but I want to be able to assure that the plants are not, you know, deficient in those minerals. Uh, boron is kind of like nitrogen. It's really hard to hold boron in the soil. So I tend to put on, um, if, especially if I'm putting calcium in the soil, I always put boron with it. At our company, we have a saying, if uh, calcium is a trucker of all minerals into a plant, boron would be represented by the steering wheel of, of a, you know, the, the calcium would be like a pickup truck. Uh, and then the boron would be visualized like a steering wheel. And so whenever we put calcium on, we always make sure we, we put a, a, you know, a, a pound or two per acre of boron with it. And that'll really help with the uptake of all the minerals into a plant. Um, iron, boron is really an important 
nutrient for hazelnut production. Yes. It affects yes. the nut set. Absolutely. And it has a lot of functions of, of trans, mm -hmm. transitioning or moving the nutrients through the plant. Um, iron is, is uh, antagonistic to, to phosphorus. So when we get our iron over 20 parts per million, then we know that the phosphorus that is available to the plants will be reduced because of iron and phosphorus, their relationship. So we, we really, uh, and how do we lower the iron? We put on more calcium. <laughs> and, uh, and I have a lot of experience with that, with growing alfalfa on dairy farms. Is, and uh, we know that uh, putting on a high grade or a, a high calcium lime uh, will really uh, lower, lessen the amount of iron content that's taken up into the plants, as long as we have boron with it. Uh, zinc is important. Um, so I, I know there's, a, you know, there's a lot of numbers on a page and I um, apologize. For, um, it's just, there's, I, I probably worked with guys for five years before they really, you know, get tuned in here to what, how to interpret these extractions and what does it mean? Um, sometimes the excesses in the soil test, like that field A on potassium is an excess that can be a, de a, de a detriment to the, to the, the health of the plant. Um, nature, to be a biological uh, farmer, we believe that uh, nature has a cleanup crew to take the sick and unhealthy out of the food chain. And so when we have um, hiccups like this, where we have an imbalance of excess potassium, that plant at night will give off gases and I know NASA has done a lot of research uh, following the, in, the insect swarms coming up out of the south on a south wind, and they'll hone in on the gases that are that are given off at night when plant when plants respirate. They can hone in on the plants that have the the, the unbalanced nutrition uh, in the soil, and so that's how um, that's how one stepping stone of becoming organic and not using insecticides is to. Um, we need to get the, the soil in better balance so that the plants are emitting balanced gases at night. And the, it's, it's, it's just a neat system that uh, our creator put together and it, it's meant to work. And uh, we have about five minutes left, Mike. Okay. And then I'll we just, have a few minutes for questions. Okay. I just want to hit on a couple of fertilizer tags that I've, that I recommend my, with my hazelnut grower that I work with. Um, so we found over seven years, we were fertilizing with a bulk spreader across the entire field and what after seven years and then we would sample soil sample the alleys separate from the row I, I call it the drip line maybe a 10 foot diameter circle under every plant would be the row and then out of that we found out that we were you know, we were getting really high fertility in the aisles and then in the, under the trees we were we weren't keeping up so what I what we did uh, this year now is we've gone to two blends uh, the 31025 blend will be used um, under the trees. It's going to have a lot more uh, potassium. We use potassium sulfate. We use ammonium sulfate. You know, on the ingredients, you can read ammonium sulfate, uh, monoammonium phosphate, which is MAP, sulfate of potash, which is 005017 sulfur, um, KMAG, which is potassium magnesium sulfate. And man we want to get some soluble magnesium. Um, because the higher the magnesium in the soil test, the less the plants get. It's the only element on the soil test that works that way. So uh, high magnesium means the, the plants are gonna get less magnesium. And then of course we homogenize and we powderize all these traces that I was talking about that are so very expensive. And we put them in, into, a, the, into the blend so that we get a more uniform application across the field. Um, so, um, so then for the row, for the alleys where we're growing uh, green cover crops, grasses, whatever, typically you just want to have something that's green and lush. And then that, of course, needs a little bit more nitrogen. And, and we found out it, 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 we can get by with less potassium and phosphorus. So we just came up with an alley blend um, with a little bit more ammonium sulfate. Um, we don't care for urea because it's uh, volatile. It'll evaporate and go into the atmosphere if we're spreading it on top. We're not able to work these, these products in. So the ammonium sulfate is stable because of the sulfur. It's a one-to-one -one ratio with nitrogen. And the sulfur acts like a carbon to lock on to the, lock the ammonia into the, the sulfur. So it, it'll stay there for probably three, three months. Um, so we might do a split application. So let's see here. 
and this slide just explains a little bit about more about CEC. Um, the, the sandier particles are have less exchange sites because they're so large. And then the little clay particles are so fine, there's just a whole lot more surface area in a clay soil. And so if you think of it like a dinner plate, uh, I always tell guys, think of it like the gallon capacity, the fuel capacity of a tractor. Um, if you've got uh, a, a CEC of five, which would be like five gallon gas tank or a CEC of 50, 50 gallon, it doesn't have much to do with horsepower, but it has a lot to do with how often we got to go back to the fuel barrel to refill. So that's maybe a, a good ex explanation of what CEs can on exchange capacity and how how that would tell us how much for how many pounds a product to put onto the onto a particular soil. Um, I I won't get into that. Um, then I I had slides here just you know talking about calcium and you know for each element uh, the the benefits. Uh, we know that calcium is uh, it's a trucker of all nutrients into the, into the plant. It improves plant and, and soil health. Uh, sulfur, uh, we like to have sulfur uh, 20 to 100 pounds per acre is on all my farms. A lot of guys were at about 40 to 60 pounds of sulfur per acre to grow. And what that sulfur does, it really makes for com complex proteins. Instead of just nitrates, uh, nitrate, nitrogen, sulfur will complex the ammonia, especially the, the nitrogens into more of ammonium form and to more plant usable form. And then uh, sulfur is also used in the humus, in the production of humus. The more sulfur in the soil, the more humus that we can produce in the, in the soil. Magnesium, um, it tight, we know that excess will tighten the soils. It can interfere with potassium uptake. Uh, the sulfur can improve magnesium availability. So that's another benefit of sulfur on the soil. We'll actually get more magnesium in, into the plants, which are typically low in magnesium because it doesn't leave the soil very easily. Um, okay, boron. Uh, in, in, key considerations, improves uptake of minerals. Uh, boron levels must be addressed annually due to loss by a leaching. Think, when you think of boron, think of nitrogen. It's, it's very volatile. It, it's not, it doesn't stay in the soil, and so we need to keep applying it. Um, zinc, um, very important for phosphorus uptake, and when we have a woody plant like hazelnuts, uh, zinc will be very important for phosphorus uptake. Um, as if the soil pHs get up over seven four seven five pH, then the zinc of all the traces tend to lose their availability. Um, a phosphorus to zinc ratio over ten to one can be detrimental. Um, um, so, let's um, let's break it yeah. up there if that's a good spot. Yeah, yeah, I think that. Um, I've got a couple questions here. Um, Yes. How often should you take a soil sample? Yeah, I uh, in our company we like uh, you know f about every f uh, fourth year. Uh, soils don't change overnight, and uh, I think uh, as far as timing of the sampling, I I like to you know uh, if we're going to sample in the spring, let's always sample in the spring and be consistent in the soil depth of the probe. Uh, if we go too deep, it'll water down the samples. If we go too shallow. It, it'll give a kind of a false reading. So it seems like a six inch depth and be, be consistent at, at year in year. Whenever you sample, always try to sample at the same depth and try to sample in the same spot. We use GPS, uh, you know, a site, uh, you know, uh, grid sampling uh, is another you know, tool that we use. And that way we can monitor, you know, I, I say, a, you know, an area, 12 by 12 foot area, and we'll just sample that same spot once every you know four years, and then we can kind of see where how is our fertility program, you know, changing the soil, and then um, you know, and uh, and then I wanted to just get into the tissue sampling. Um, tissue sampling, I use it as a diagnostic tool to compare a bad tree to a good tree, and then what, and then realize that the leaves on the trees are the oldest leaves are on the bottom, the newest leaves are towards the the top or the outside. And the, the, the labs, of course, would like a leaf in the middle. Uh, so corn leaves, we always take the leaf opposite of the ear. On hazelnuts, I would kind of shoot for that medium area of the tree, uh, reach in and you know grab about uh, 20 to 30 leaves, put them in a paper bag and mail them to the lab. The, the tissue, and then I would, like I say, I use uh, tissue sampling 
you have to do at least two and you always want to do a stress plant versus a healthy plant. And then you can get a, to just do a tissue test on a, on a, on a tree, the moisture, what, what's not on a tissue test is the pounds of dry matter per acre. So you have no, there's no, you can't put pounds to your percent. So it, what happens is, is in a drought, the percent of extraction of the minerals is quite high because there's less water and, and the leaves are, you know, are dried out more. And if we have a rainy period, the, the, the readings coming back from the tissue sample will be quite low because the water, you know, it just, the, the, if, we weighed the, the, if we weighed the leaves per acre, uh, they, we'd probably find that they will, on a dry year, the calcium potassium levels were the same as a wet year, but the percentage could be half. The, 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 the tissue sample comes back as a percent. And so that's where you really need to understand what is a, what is a, a tissue sample and what is it really telling us. It, it's a powerful tool for me. It's like a report card on how well my fertilizers are, uh, you know, getting into the plant. But I can't just look at one plant. I got to maybe do two or three tissues, you know, like I say, find a, find a, a, a good spot, find a bad spot in the plant or in a, you know, good plants and versus bad, bad, unhealthier plants. And then, then you have something to say, oh yeah, we got to go up the boron or we got up the copper. Um, you know, the, the leaf, the tissue sampling is very, very good, very accurate. And those labs, no matter where you send it is they're standardized. So you don't have to worry about inter having somebody interpret the results. Um, and the labs also provide um, kind of an ideal level for the levels, but they don't know what kind of moisture conditions the, the, the plants are in when you took the sample. And that's where you can have, you know, you can, you might end up, so, oh my gosh, my phosphorus levels are low. Well, it, we had a lot of rain, so they would be low, but let's say we're going through a drought and you say, oh my gosh, you know, my, my phosphorus levels are really high, but as soon as it rains, they'll drop, you know, back to normal levels. So you have to kind of take it, with a grain of salt, the tissue sampling is, is what I found in, in, with my experience. Okay, we're gonna have to end it there. Thank you very much for um, mm -hmm. the information. Um, I think it'll be useful for the hazelnut growers there. Um, yep, my email growers. address is, I think it's in the proceedings, um, okay. Mike, uh, mike.lovelyan at midwesternbioag.com. So, okay. Thank you very much. Sounds good, thank you. Bye-bye. We're going to move into the plant nursery showcase now. So I think you'll find this um, interesting and good. Um, we're going to start off with um, Brian Byers. He's with Great Plains Nursery out of Weston, Nebraska. And he's got a, um, some of the nurseries have prepared a video or PowerPoint and then um, will be available to answer questions after that. So. Um, Brian's got a video and we'll start with that and then um, um, see how it goes. Brian, you are muted if you want to be saying something. Is that working now? Perfect. Yep. Okay. Hey, Brian, if you're going to share a video um, before you screen share, when you click the screen share button, you need there's a little box you need to check at the bottom of the screen that says allow audio. Okay. So click that little green screen share button at the bottom of the screen. Okay. And then read um, at the bottom of that. Share computer sound and. There you go. Click okay. that and then you're good to go. Okay, I think I got it going. Is that on there then, the video? Yep, Great Plains Nursery. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so hi everyone. I'm Brian Byers with Great Plains Nursery. Uh, family owned. My wife and I run it. We've for 13 years now been growing native trees and shrubs um, and got in with the University of Nebraska and the Nebraska Forest Service along with the Hazelnut Consortium on growing some varieties that they found have done well in the Midwest. Um, I threw together a little video here just to kind of show you what we do. Uh, most hazelnuts are grown in a quart size container and um, we do get up into the gallons. We've always grown the American hazelnut, uh, but now kind of getting into the, the 
the hybrids, uh, everything we do is the clone variety. And then we do have some just seed grown uh, that are collected from the forest service <laughs> orchards uh, that are, would be considered more of a hybrid hazelnut. So I'll go ahead and play this and then any questions feel free to ask. At Great Plains Nursery, we carry the Grand Traverse and the Beast hybrid hazelnuts. With research from the Nebraska Forest Service and the Hybrid Hazelnut Consortium, these two varieties have proven to grow well in the Midwest, as well as being great producers of quality hazelnuts. Currently, for spring delivery, we have 21 gallon Grand Traverse and 32 quart size Traverse. For June and fall delivery, we will have around <laughs> 1,500 of each variety in a quart size. Plants can be picked up at the nursery or shipped via UPS. For more information, give us a call at 402-540-4801 or send an email to info at greatplainsnursery.com. Other trees and shrubs can be found on our website at greatplainsnursery.com. At Great Plains Nursery, we carry uh, the grant. So that's a little bit about us. Um, everything we do bring in is tissue cultures from North American plants and have had great success. What we saw grow last year, that was our first year with the beast um, and have been very pleased with, with how it does in the, the nursery. Um, talking with Aaron Clare earlier, there's no huge updates with the varieties. He's with the Nebraska Forest Service. Um, everything's kind of still in the trial phases with the beast. Uh, everything's pretty young to really be producing much for for the nuts yet, but they do show good luck. Um, that's all I have on us and and what we're doing for hazelnut production. Did that all work? Linda, I think you're muted. Oh, okay. I thought I did something wrong there. Sorry. Okay, we're. I don't have any questions for Brian. Um, just a minute, one might have come in. What zone are you in? Uh, so we're in zone five, uh, kind of on the border of five A and five B. How precise you want to get, but um, the the plants down at Horning Farm where the the beast is collected at is um, just about a half hour south of Omaha, Nebraska. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to our next um, plant nursery. Z's Nutty Ridge is muted. So can you guys hear me? There you go. Can you see me? Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I want to share my screen. All right. Okay. Got to change screens. What screen are you guys seeing? Just the Zoom screen. We see you. Uh, you don't see my desktop? No. Okay. So you want to click sh screen share and then pick what screen you want us to see and then click share again. There we go. Okay, and now we see your desktop. All right, I only want to see my right screen. You guys, what screen do you see? We still just see your desktop. Okay, so I got to change the screen you see. How's that? We still just see your desktop. Oh, there we go. Now we see your PowerPoint. Okay, good. All right, so hi guys. I'm glad you're here. I'm, I'm glad we're able to be uh, part of this presentation. Um, the farm, our orchard's run by myself and my wife, Dawn. And whoops, went too far. We're located in, in uh, upstate New York. And you can see on the right-hand side here, we're right between Syracuse and Ithaca on a hilltop. Um, 
that is very windy. And since we've been here since 1992, we've planted out over 10,000 hazelnut trees, looking for the great trees, much like UMHDI and the hazelnut consortium is and Tom Molnar at Rutgers. And we've found numerous trees. Um, we're watching them still. I think we'll have four or five trees coming out here in the next couple of years. We'll talk about one in particular and, is, and our efforts to bring these trees to you. So we're really windy. We're at 1,700 feet. We overlook a, a valley 600 feet below us. And we're facing the northwest winds that come and howl at us in the wintertime. So uh, the trees have to survive a strong breeze. We're so windy that we put up a windmill. Um, we don't really only do hazelnut, we do chestnut as well as uh, experimenting with hybrid walnuts. And we tell people what we're doing and we've been doing since basically seriously in earnest since 1995. We get comments like nut trees, really? That's a thing. Why would you do that? So it's, you know, we all are motivated to do plant, in our case, in this case, hazelnuts for various reasons. But um, when we moved to our hilltop, this is a fairly recent picture, but 30 years ago, these what looks like woods and forests were half grown in and being reclaimed. We thought that was a tremendous waste of land. And you can still a lot of, see a lot of trees uh, taking over the fields. And we have these soft rolling hillsides that have been reclaimed for, been getting reclaimed probably since, uh, you know, 1940s, 1950s. And so we thought that was a huge waste. And we saw that nature was planting trees all by itself. We figured, yep we need to find the tree that we can all grow. So it turns out, whoops, turns out that, uh, you know, everybody's all afraid about the Amazon forest being burnt down. And all throughout the Northeast, we pretty much did that already. In the 1890s, we cleared all the lands. And you can see on the picture of Cortland County here back in 1894, and according to the census, we literally cleared all the trees off the land except for hedgerows. And so what we saw occurring back 30 years ago where all the fields are being regrown by trees, um, we went into our library and dug up a census, you know, from way back when, a uh, book was really torn up, shredded. And we dug through and saw that, you know, like the previous slide, there was 200 sawmills in the county. We looked today and that same picture, slightly different angle, uh, the hills now are all reclaimed and are back to trees. So we thought this was a huge waste of uh, effort by our forefathers. So we have been finding the trees for the last 30 years that will grow well in our area, in our region. And you guys are all here today knowing full well that hazelnuts is your selection. Uh, it turns out that hazelnuts and chestnuts are probably the best things to grow on these hillsides, at least here in the Northeast, um, and they're native. So we've been working hard. Uh, through control pollinations, collecting, catkins, bagging, uh, controlled, cross, controlled cross pollinations, uh, layering. Uh, this is from four or five years ago, early spring. See the snow in the background in the greenhouse here. Uh, it's fairly easy to do. I, if you guys have good trees, I suggest you do it. The problem with layering is it's a multi-year effort. We actually generate um, trees in quantity. To that end, we've been planting out colonial orchards. And you can see here where we've been layering trees. And it's a trade off between how many trees we sell to people versus how many trees we plant out. We have a lot of land to plant out, and we're actively planting out land like crazy uh, with our clones. And tissue culture for our trees have not yet been successful. Uh, tissue culture labs are struggling to get our trees into production. Um, for us, we ourselves actually do tissue culture uh, and chestnut trees. So, and you can see here, we do our uh, layering with single stem trees. We also have many acres of bush form, much like UMHDI is doing. But for production, for our layers, we use single stem trees. Here's some pictures from our nursery, we sell a lot of seedlings. Um, and these seedlings only come off our eight best trees. Uh, we don't sell just random seeds. We have a lot of people trying to buy seeds from us so they can resell to other people. We generally won't do that. 
unless they come from our eight best trees. Um, and we grow these in our greenhouse initially using ebb flow trays, and then we transfer them out the field. Normally, we get a much bigger stock in one year's time. Last year was a little tough. Uh, the fields were extra dry, even though normally we're, uh, we get plenty of rain. Last year was dry and the trees didn't grow as well as we'd like, but there's still tons of trees and they're much bigger than your typical uh, planted out trees in the field. By growing them in the greenhouse first, get a, they had a couple month head start. And like you've heard earlier today, you need seedlings for pollination insurance. So we've been growing those as well. Um, we do tissue culture, like I said, uh, in conjunction with uh, SUNY ESF up here in Syracuse, uh, they taught us how to do tissue culture. We're tissue culturing trees, chestnut trees. We're trying to, we aren't, we haven't been in the past. We've been hired out tissue culture labs to bring our stuff into tissue culture. But as Jason mentioned earlier, it's pretty difficult. Um, the labs are getting better. Um, soon we hope to have our trees, uh, much more than one. But one right now we're talking about NICA into tissue culture. And in the previous pictures, you saw that we were layering them like crazy. So a uh, little information on NICA. Uh, it's, we've sent some trees to Tom Molnar down in Rutgers, as well as the guys out in Nebraska for their test plantings. Um, and this is uh, the main tree that we've been layering and propagating out. It is very unbelievable bush. Uh, you can see here from the stats, uh, it's a very cold hardy, produces lots of catkins, very productive tree. Um, if you plant 500 plus trees per acre, uh, there's a fairly high yield that you should be getting uh, from uh, one and a quarter tons to approaching two tons per acre. And it's a smaller tree. It's, uh, it'll, right now, 25 years old, I don't know if it's 12 foot tall. But it is a, you can grow it as, it's a semi-bush, I call it. You can grow it as a bush you see down below or as a single stem tree. We have a question regarding this uh, Nitka. Mm -hmm. And it says, is Nitka a clone of G029N from Badgerset or a seedling? That I don't know. Uh, these are trees I got from Badgerset that I tell everybody right up front. Uh, he's a pioneer and we should all appreciate the guy. But uh, that one, I don't know. Okay, and thank you. This, actually, it's GO29N, it looks like it is. Um, could very well be. Um, and here's pictures of it again. Uh, and it grows very differently. You really need to watch your uh, leaf tissue analysis. Uh, because the, the nut, when you don't fertilize it very well, it looks very smooth and uniform. And then when you fertilize it, you get that. It's a very large nut. Uh, and I can tell you, you need to watch your leaf analysis. Um, and it's great kernel, 52 to 55%. Um, and this size, it was 1.1 grams on average. And when you Fertilize it, it's, everything's much bigger. Um, we too will be selling trees from North American plants. Um, I don't like to place, take orders until I have my uh, chickens counted. So right now I feel I have eggs. I don't have my egg, chickens counted. So this fall we'll be uh, selling trees from North American plants as well. Um, right, we have a, another question. What is the average percentage of your seedlings that are similar in traits to the mother tree? Uh, well, actually, there's different mother trees. Some mother trees, a lot of traits are passed on desired traits. So, you know, a seedling's only half the mom. And so you have to be careful. And this is really true in chestnuts. The desired traits you want, you want to see them get passed on. The seedlings from Nika. They often produce very thin shelled nuts. And that's why we call them Cortlands, because we realize that they was, it's a good mother tree and the thin shell characteristic is passed on. So we list that as a, a separate seedling you can buy, as opposed to our Finger Lakes Abundance, 
which is the other seven trees that we selected as being superior. Now, I'll, I can't tell you on the other eight trees how good the traits are, but we noticed the offspring from NICO is uh, very often had very thin shells. But I would not recommend anybody planning out, uh, trying to plant a commercial orchard with just seedlings. I think seedlings are mainly for pollination insurance. Every fifth row or so have planted out as seedlings. So, and over the years, we've probably done everything wrong and we've learned to do things right with our failures. And I spent a lot of time, wife and I, on the phone with people discussing the same questions over and over again. And to save time, we decided that we needed to write a book. So we now have this book. It's very a practical book, and it answers most all the questions that people ever ask. So uh, I, it's very, you can get it at, from our, us on our website or on Amazon. But it'll help all you starters, and actually people have been into it for a few years. Uh, it, it answers all the questions that we had to answer because we really didn't have anybody to go to 20 years ago. Um, so learn from our mistakes. That's basically what the book's all about. Um, here's another picture that us and our bush form at orchard. And uh, we pretty much live, eat, and breathe nut trees. Any other questions for me? Yeah, one other one that's come in so far. Um, do you know the alleles for your selections? Uh, no, uh, I do not. Tom Molnar offered to help out. Um, and I want to try to take him up on it if he still offers it this spring. So that came from Linda Grimo. So um, she might talk direct to you. Cool. If she has the ability to do that, then I would love to. All right, um, let me see. I don't have any more questions at this time. So thank you very much. <clears throat> very interesting. We'll have to be checking out that book and um, learning more. That's what it's about. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you much, guys. Thank you. Next, we're going to go to Foggy Bottom Farms in Columbus, New Jersey. Don Nisak um, has a video, so we'll get him up. Can you hear me there, Linda? Yes. All right. You can see the um, video. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. All right. Here we go. Hello. I'm Don Knezik, owner of Foggy Bottom Tree Farm. I'm proud to say that we have the license from Rutgers University to grow their patented hazelnuts, Hunterton, Mammoth, Raritan, and Somerset. We also have a license to sell Oregon State University's clone, The Beast. I've been in the nursery business for just about my entire career. I started out working with the U.S. Forest Service and the New Jersey Bureau of Forest Management growing uh, hybrid pine trees for re reforestation purposes. In 1983, I established Pinelands Nursery, which became one of the largest native plant growers in the United States. A couple years ago, I retired and I decided to open up Foggy Bottom Tree Farm when the opportunity from Rutgers uh, arose. And I'm very, very happy to be spending the last few years of my career growing hazelnuts. The big advantage of the Rutgers clones is that they are resistant to Eastern filbert blight they are European hazelnuts and they have very desirable nuts, big, large nuts, uh, very well tasting. The big advantage of the beast is that it's a great pollinizer. The nuts aren't the, the best in the world, but it pollinizes all four Rutgers clones. So anyway, the material that we have is excellent for establishing a hazelnut orchard. Now I'm growing my plants in what's known as an elipot. This is an elipot here. You can see it has an excellent root system. These plants are air pruned and promoting great fibrous roots on the outside of the pot. So when they're planted, they take off very, very rapidly. We've only been doing this for a couple of years now, so we don't have a whole lot of stock. We have a wonderful partner in a tissue culture lab in Wisconsin that produces the plants and they're refining their techniques and every year they get us more and more plants. 
Now this plant and the rest of these over here were potted up in September, so they really have That's the end of the video. Well, it went on a little bit further, but I guess it got cut off somehow, but that's fine. Uh, so basically we have uh, a few thousand plants that we're gonna be able to sell this fall. Most of them are already committed. Unfortunately, the tissue culture lab has had some uh, additional issues this year and we're gonna get a quite a few less plants than I had anticipated. So we probably won't have any availability until uh, the following fall, the fall of 2022. But we're making progress. We have, a, like I say, a great relationship with the tissue culture lab in Wisconsin. We also are getting our uh, beasts from North American plants. And in the future, I'm sure we're gonna have a, a very nice supply of hazelnuts for sale. Thank you for everyone listening. Thank you. Um, I have a question here, let me look. Um, it says, what size containers are the plants being sold in? The plants, uh, we're experimenting with a, an elipot, which is an 80 millimeter by 160 millimeter deep elipot. Now that size pot and that elipot was recommended to me by a nursery in California that specializes in nut trees. I'm also experimenting with a slightly larger diameter pot, which would be 100 millimeters by 160 millimeters. We're gonna grow our, uh, the beasts in those and see how well they do. Uh, there are you know, some issues with growing things in a smaller pot because it gets a little bit harder to keep them well watered. Uh, but the big advantage is that we can keep the price down by growing quite a few plants in a small area. Okay, thank you. Um, it says, does this type of European hazel drop its nuts when they are ripe? Yes, they do. That's an important thing that uh, they have that characteristic where they all four of the, uh, the Rutgers clones will drop the nuts. Okay. And all That's four all. are resistant to Go eastern ahead. filter blight. Yeah. Um, that's all the questions I have. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you and sorry for the problems with the video. Oh, no problem. We're, we didn't have very many today. So that's good. <laughs> um, all right, so this will end our uh, program for today. We'll be going tomorrow and the topics will be around the research um, area. And uh, Jeff, or excuse me, Jason Fishbach will be um, talking about the hazelnut grower cluster groups that are formed here in the Midwest um, at 8.30 when you come on tomorrow. And um, so if you're interested in that, come on look at 8.30. Otherwise, the rest of the program will start at nine. So thank you very much.